My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Pass something to him, just tell God. Tell him how much you love him. Tell him how grateful you are to be in his presence. Tell him how grateful you are tonight to be in his presence. The Bible says, Sinners shall not stand in the congregation of the righteous. Sinners shall not stand. In the congregation of the righteous. Here you are numbered. You are not numbered in the church. You are numbered in God. That is why you are here. You are numbered in God. We don't count church members. We count citizens of Zion. Can you give him thanks? Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Most times our greatest problem is that we can't talk to the one we need to talk to. You tell every other person, every other thing that is going wrong in your life. But the one that has the powers, the one that has the solution, is the one you never talk to. Talk to Jesus, talk to Jesus. Whisper something. Whisper something. Amanda Braxta, sobre na tabaliga paranda sovia. Rakabanda Braxto, sobre la maranda tariasta. Rakunde sabarido, sobre rata sabarana. Raina tapali kabranda zazali kapara kabaria namata. Lika papa parada zabanda paraga tapaporia. Zela kapapare na sonde paradiasta. Anlo marakate, sobre na taliga bando. Thank you, Father. Shamra mata zuzuri na marada bandere digas. Shepa kato zuzundri paradados. Stay yourself up in the Holy Ghost. Stay up your spirit, man. Stay up your spirit, man. Is it building up yourself upon your most holy faith? Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Building up yourself, building up yourself. Rain in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Listen. If you want to grow in God, one of many things you need to begin to consciously do is to engage scriptures practically and see the efficacy of scriptures in your life. Then you begin to gain experiential faith. If your faith does not travel from theoretical faith to experiential faith, you will never grow in God. And you will not have the capacity to alter the affairs of your life that have existential implications. You may start off when your brother is sick or somebody is dying and then you go and start shouting the name of Jesus. You don't believe in it. If you don't engage the simple ones and grow thereby, the Bible said, building up yourself upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. The question is, how many times do you build up when you pray in the Holy Ghost? 
So you will not know that you don't even believe in the things you are reading. They are just rhetorics or religious cliches that you were taught to know. And then you think it will work. You have to consciously begin to engage the, the scriptures that have pragmatic effect. And then you build like that. And then when you come to areas where you don't have understanding, by that time, your faith has grown. Some can't even talk to God. There are few times you meet people that can speak into your life. Most of the times you are the prophet over your life. And you don't notice why your life is not moving. You are the one talking the most to yourself. And most of the things you say you don't believe them. So there are no effects. There are no positive implications. Can you talk to Jesus for a moment? The service will not last for more than two hours. But you have a lifetime of working with God. Talk to God. Talk to God. If you believe that if you tell him he will hear, he will say it with a different motivation. If they call you now and say the governor wants to grant you audience for five minutes. <laughs> you will just be noticing. If, if the man acts as if he wants to be generous. You will begin to download all your problems. Because you believe that he has the capacity to help you. If you believe in God. Your interactions with him will be different. Your communication towards him will be different. Your attitude, your responses to him. They will be different. People come to the presence of God and they are so down. So down. It's just another religious gathering. They don't even have expectations. People don't even come with expectations. Meanwhile, the law of the spirit is that the power of God works in the direction of your expectation. It's a shame if a righteous man has no expectation. What will God attend to? What will he do? Even the ones he do, you will not know it and you will not believe it because you are a natural man. It won't make sense. It won't make meaning to you. Talk to Jesus. Sarabanda Bragadasus. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you glory. You want to take a flight in the spirit? You want to build up in tongues? You want to ascend to high places? You want to touch the energy level? You want to go to high places? Rakopateka barina sapata Revanata barianda paradadas Rakabanda parosto separania Liga bombre nas caparedos Rakopa te cabaria Ramina tapa Reto zondro facta pare Omala tarahina mate Saka branda branda zozo Rekapaliga para sandra para dadas Sika pate ke bondo para tatalia talimata Zetombra kate caparia Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you praise. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Listen. The power of God is a tangible substance. It's not a psychological sensation. Where you get, you talk people to a place and then, because they have gotten emotional, you strike a call. No. It's a tangible thing. Most, most times the reason we, we try to minister in the spirit after the meeting is because we want to instruct the hearts of men before we begin to minister. Because if you begin to minister in the power, the decorum is distorted. It's not because you want to get people to a place before you can now begin. No, no, no. It's a tangible force. If it is there, it's there. If it's not there, it's not there. Get this religiosity out of your mind and begin to engage God pragmatically. One of the obsessions of spirits is to be trusted, to be believed. If you come around God and you are doing a psychological stunt around him, the statement you are making is you are telling him you don't believe in him. You may go by for a long time, but God will detest that action because he judges your heart. He's seeing your intentions. 
Don't play around. Don't play around. Be focused. Be objective. God has the capacity to meet you at the point of your need. Can you ask God for something before we begin the teaching? Just whisper something to the Lord as quietly the way we are now. Just whisper something to the Lord. Maybe you didn't come for the meeting with an expectation. You, you have a ticket now to do so. Whisper something to the Lord very quickly. inserted on your chest, at the top part of your chest. There's a pain. Before the service is over, it will vanish. You will know that you don't necessarily need hands to be laid on you. Things happen on their own accord when you come to the presence. On their own accord. Because the presence of God has the capacity to doctor your challenges and to bring solutions. You will just find that it, it goes, it leaves like that. The pain. By the way, who's the person that has pain on the chest? On the top part of your chest. Top part of your chest. You find it difficult to swallow as if it's a weight on your chest. Very heavy on your chest. I'm not saying, can I see the hand? The other one? Okay, it will vanish before the service is over. Nobody will minister to you. You just know it's not, it's not about the laying on of hands. There are so many things that can happen in the presence of God. Ah, ah, hey. I have a knowing in my spirit that there's a, a lady here. I'm not seeing. It's a knowing in my spirit that there's a lady here that the spirit of death have haunted you for almost two years now. You are just afraid that you will die. 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 You are afraid. The fear of death. The Bible says fear brings torment. It will just go. 
then you know it's an energy. It's not just you thinking. It's a demon trying to bring you under bondage. The fear will just leave like that. give you praise we give you glory have your way lord in jesus precious name we have prayed god bless you, you may be seated give a coming i want to salute the pastors in the house our very old father is here Reverend Shala Uka. can you give jesus a big hand mighty man in the kingdom reverend tony george reverend george abike and mommy Budu. Give God the glory for His work and dealing in your lives, and for being a blessing to us. Tonight, I want to share with you something very quickly, and I'm going to be using scriptures, all right? Because what I want, what I want to share with you this evening, is to give you an assurance beyond traditions, the traditions of men. Is to give you an assurance before beyond the philosophies and the ideologies that you have come about. By listening to too many persons. You know, sometimes when you listen to too many persons, there's a chaos because there will be a, con- a, a, a conflict of ideas in your mind and you will not necessarily know what to believe. You know, I told us the last time, I said one of the things that creates fear is a sense of uncertainty. And uncertainty comes when there is no definition in understanding. You don't know exactly what to believe. You believe too many things and it may not be serious. To make, it may not be an important issue until there's crisis. You know, you may be, know so many things about healing, so many things. And it may not matter until you are sick and you are dying. And suddenly you are in the hospital and then the doctors come around your bed. And then somebody examines you, examines you and then he calls another doctor. And then he calls another doctor. And then you now see four doctors stand. And then you are watching. If you were sleeping, you now open one of your eyes. And then you see they are doing like this. You will know that you're, 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 there's a problem. At that point, you will realize that unless God comes through for you now, because you will sense somewhere that this thing don't pass this doctor's power, then you will now begin to check your mind, check your spirit. What do I really believe about healing? Should I call somebody to come and pray for me now? You now begin to check your phone. Which man of God will come and pray? And then you, you are now trying to exercise your faith at the same time. You, you won't know which one works. Because that contradiction was there. You never straightened it out. Maybe all you believed about healing was that if a man of stature lays hands, something will happen. Now you are sick and there's no man of stature around. Then you, you find yourself in a terrible crisis. At that point, you will discover that, oh, is this how I'm going to leave this world? If you reach a point where you are defeated in your mind, know that the, the battle is already lost. If you start asking yourself, is this how I'm going to leave this world? You have left already. Unless mercy speaks for you, you are gone. I want to share certain things with us today that we are going to begin to exercise our faith consciously in in order to have definition in life and to have victory in every affair of our life. Because like I said, the best helper you will get for your life and destiny apart from the Holy Spirit is yourself. You will think people are praying for you until somebody has a crisis and says, sorry, my sister is about to die. Please pray for me. Stand with me in prayer. Then you say, yes, I'll stand in prayer. You go home, then you sleep till the next morning. You will now remember by 10 o'clock, I didn't pray for this person. Then they will say, the person has died. The same way you didn't pray for the person, that's how many people are not praying for you. You will say, ah, the, the intercessors, they are praying for me. They are not. If they remember you, thank God. And if God puts a burden in the heart of people. You know, when you start working for God, the reason he puts burden in people's heart is because it is natural for people to forget to pray for others. You are the best help for your life apart from the Holy Spirit. And you need to know how these things work and then engage them. The emphasis I'm bringing tonight is something that is going to orchestrate a paradigm shift in your mind. 
the Holy Ghost began to teach me, he said, what conducts the power of God is your mind. You may come under an atmosphere full of power. You will not make use of it. For those of us that are ministers, we know what we are saying. You can be in a meeting, people are falling everywhere. And then they will stand up, go back, sick and demonized. If you want to help them, then you will consciously begin to channel the power. You begin to break the chains. You begin to command the sicknesses to leave. Else, the people will enjoy the atmosphere and go back in bondage. Because the power of God is an intelligent substance. It must be conducted. And for your own life, if you don't know how to conduct the power of God and direct it to definite emphasis and definite challenges of your life, you will know that you sense God, you touch God, but you will not have results. How many of you have been to that place where you are praying and then every time you go to pray, a hand is touching you? A hand is touching you. So when they are giving testimony, they say, how many people have experiences with God? You jump up. And every time I pray, my right hand is on fire, but it will not amount to anything. It has no use. That your right hand is on fire have no use until wisdom comes as to what that thing is and you know how to channel the resources of that substance. That's why we have a lot of experiences and experiences have become our God but there is nothing happening on the landscape. A lot of people boast of many encounters but there's nothing to show because there is no shift in the mind. The guy is having encounters with angelic beings but he's a slave he's in, his, in his mind. He's dwarfed in the mind. So even though God wants to help him, there is nothing God can do about it. The best way God can help that man is to begin to help his mind. There was a young man in Judges chapter 6 who sat down lamenting all his life. When we God save us, is it not the God they told us did miracles and saved our fathers from Egypt? Is that God real? <laughs> is God real? Some people have even become atheists Because they came to a point, they say, why is evil everywhere in the world? If God is there, why is there evil? Why are people dying? No, I don't think God is there. <laughs> Somebody asked Rabbi Zacharias. He said, if God is real, he said, God is not real. Rabbi Zacharias said, why? He said, if God is real, why is there evil everywhere? Rabbi Zacharias now asked him, okay, if you say there is evil, it means you are also assuming that there is good. He said, yes. He said, okay, if you are assuming that there is good and there is evil, it then also means you are also assuming that there is a moral law on the basis of which you can distinguish between good and evil. He said, yes, of course. He said, if you are assuming there is a moral law, then you are also assuming there is a moral law giver. Uh, the guy said, yes, uh, yes, probably. He said, okay. <laughs> if you are assuming there is a moral law giver, it then means that you are affirming that there is God. You are not disproving God. You are actually approving that there is a God. Because if there is no moral law giver, there is no moral law. If there is no moral law, there is no good. If there is no good, there is no evil. So what is your question? The guy had no question. Is a confused man. Why is there a problem? We are in bondage. They say God is there. They say God delivered our father. You may not know that's what was going on in his mind. Until the angel came and saluted him. He said, thou mighty man of valor. In heaven, the guy was a man of rank. But he was dwarfed on earth in his mind. He said, thou my... That's how the angel saluted him. Thou mighty man of valor. And the guy, he had not even spoken with the guy. The guy began to lament about the crisis of the people. That means he had an, an accurate and a legitimate body. But the capacity to fulfill was also there. However, the mind was his cause. He had a body to deliver the people, which was correct. Because the emphasis on the calendar of heaven at that time was deliverance for Israel from the hands of the Midianites. So his body was correct. He also had the capacity because he was not lacking in capacity. As far as heaven was concerned, he was a mighty man. And he was also a man of valor. His crisis was his mind. And when the angel finished, he said, go in this thy might. They didn't add any might to him. He said, go in this thy might. Everything the guy needs is already in him. But his mind was cursed. If God wants to begin to help you, he begins to shift your mind. If there's no shift in your mind, there is little or nothing you can do. Bishop Oedipo said, every man's calling is equally high. But everyone will determine the height of his calling. There are many of us, God have appeared to you and told you you are called. But you are waiting for that time in the church where they will stand up and say, Abba Benedict, can I prophesy to you? Then you say, yes, man of God. And then when you come, you say, you are an apostle to the nations. And then you turn and say, is the church full today? Okay, let the people know. When I say I'm an apostle, they think I'm joking. Now, at least God is confirming it. Let them hear. 
they have missed the emphasis. <laughs> Meanwhile, my friend is a is a is not like that. I I I love this man. So somehow the name just came to my spirit. But that's the challenge with most of us. We are looking for the approval of men. There's a cost. It works in the mind. And if the devil gets you down in the mind, he has finished with you. It doesn't matter how anointed you are. I want to show you tonight the sevenfold dimensions of the power of God and how you will begin to engage it consciously. You know, today I'm not coming to you as a revivalist. So it's not necessarily a Puritan capsule. Your soul may not be steered. But if you learn this principle, you will begin to give birth to the dimensions you have been impregnated with since you were born. Some of us are mighty. Come on, laugh and give me some now. Don't, you now, you want to dwarf me in the spirit. <laughs> The first dimension of the oppression. Listen, let, before I even begin to mention the dimension, let me show you something. The Bible began, the Bible opened up by proclaiming the existence of God. The Bible never tried to defend whether God was real or whether God was there or not. It just said in the beginning, God. Whether you believe it or not, that's your business. Because the being want to talk about his, his credentials cannot be read out. You can't read out his credentials among men. There's nothing he wants to prove. You know, the reason you try to validate things is because you want to verify the authenticity of that thing, the veracity of that thing, the credibility of that thing. This being doesn't need to be verified. You don't need to prove him. He is all by himself who he is. So the Bible didn't bother trying to tell you that God is real. God is, he said in the beginning, God. And the first introduction that he gave God revealed him in two dimensions. The first one is that he's a being of mystery. So the word God is the word Elohim. Elohim means the existence of three in one. Perfect harmony in plurality. It's a reality the mind cannot capture. Before you can understand the intricacies that govern the operation of, 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 of the Trinity, you must go to a higher dimension. Your, your mind can't capture it on this plane. You know, if you are existing on a plane, all you know is a line. And the guy existing in the reality of a line, he cannot understand three dimensions. It's not possible. Because line is just one. And then when you are existing as a shape, you, you exist as two dimensions. If you see a square, all he knows is two dimensions. Either horizontally or vertical. That's correct, right? <laughs> if I, vertically or horizontally. If you tell a being operating in the reality of a, of a, a shape that you can be in a room like this, he can't understand it. Because he doesn't know the Z coordinate. But you are operating in three dimensions. So you know that it's possible for eight squares to be one. This building you are seeing now is eight square existing as one. And that's why you can be in this building. There's a box, there's a square here, there's a square here, there's a square here, there's a square up and down. So you know it's possible. Because you operate in three dimensions. Now when you talk about the possibility of three being one at the same time, it is a reality that is a bit higher than your plane of reference. So you can't understand it. So the Bible introduces God, first of all, as a being of mystery. And secondly, the Bible introduces God as a being of power. Because the word Elohim means almighty. It means it's not just mighty. Every might is in him. It is from him that might originates. So he reveals God as a being of power. So for instance, they ask you who is God. If you say God is the being of power, you are correct. That's how the Bible introducing him. He introduced him. He's a being of power. And everywhere you see the name of God mentioned in scripture, you cannot define God apart from power. After he was introduced as Elohim, the next time he was introduced is Jehovah Elohim. And the word Jehovah also refers to the almighty that has the authority to judge iniquity. And the reason he has the right to demand righteousness and justice is because everything belongs to him. If I hold this shirt now and tear it, you can't come and trouble me. Say, why is the tear? Is it your shirt? But God can demand from the fallen man because he owns creation. So that revelation also speaks of him as a God of power. The first man that began doing business with him intimately, that gave him a name, was Abraham. They called him the El Shaddai. And the El Shaddai also is a revelation of power. Having the capacity to supply all and without himself depleting in essence. God is the only being that keeps giving, keeps giving, but never depletes. It's a statement of a strange kind of power that cannot be understood. If you think it's a joke, begin to run around this building. When you run two times, 
they will notice that you deplete. And you, your energy will keep, you will lose energy constantly. That's one of the greatest challenges of science. And it kept science at one spot for many hundred years. It's until they discovered the principle of quantum mechanics that they understood that it's possible for an electron to move at an energy level and not emit energy. Before science got there, ah, they were stagnated. But the revelation of God as the El Shaddai reveals him to be constantly supplying but never depleting in essence. Everywhere God is mentioned is power. Is power. And then the Bible came and began to reveal another species that came out of God. And he said that species was created in his image and likeness. That means if God is a being of power, you are an offspring of power. The reason most of the times the Bible goes through the route of explaining the lexicons of the reality of God is so that when he tells you you come from God, you begin to see yourself from a higher plane. It's possible for you to judge yourself by everything people have called you. It's possible to look at yourself by the value system of the world or the values that have been placed on your life. But just in case you look at the scripture, that's why the Bible said the scriptures are for exhortation. They are for edification. They are for instructions in righteousness. You may be at a point where they say you have no value. Suddenly you look on the scriptures and they tell you who God is. And then the next time you begin to read, they now tell you, you are the child of God. It will first of all begin to confound your life. Because your life may not conform to the dimensions of the God that you came out from. You know, when Bishop Oedeko began in 1986 that we are God, everybody fought him. He said, if a goat gives birth to a, a child, what do you call it? It's a goat. He said, just in case this revelation is too big for you. He said, if a lion gives birth to a child, what do you call it? He said, lion. He said if God gives birth to a child, what do you call it? And the church could not receive it for many years, more than a decade. But the truth is, you are an offspring of power. The Bible said in John chapter 1 verse 12, it says, as many as believed, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. So you can never be the child of God except power is a cardinal expression in your life. If there's no power in your life, it's either you are grossly in ignorance or you are not really a child of God. You know, there is a doctrine now that Everybody is talking about character, talking about purity, talking about fidelity. And then there's a phrase that is not well explained, grossly misunderstood. With power you shake the world, but with character you keep it. If you don't have influence, who cares about your character? Have you gone to the barrier before and say, what's the character of this dead person? The reason character is important is because there is impact. So they know that if you have the wrong character, anything you impact, you will transmit the wrong character. So impact is equally important as character. Jesus was a man of character for 30 years. He didn't shake his community. But the day power came, the Bible said that it might be fulfilled. Prophecy began to speak immediately. Prophecy gained utterance and vocabulary. That which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. In the land of Zebulun, in the land of Naphtali. By the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people that sat in darkness. So Jesus was sitting in darkness with them, with good character. It's when power came that light sprung up. So the salvation of the people was based on power, not character. If you are a person, a believer, and there's no power in your life, no matter how good you are, you'll be a puppet in the hands of the devil. And let me correct something. Even the character you speak about is a manifestation of power. That's why many people try to keep rules, discipline. They try to. Uh, they, they. <laughs> you don't know what is happening. Demons. <laughs> oh my God. Have you heard about a familiar spirit? Have you heard about a familiar spirit? One of the capacities of a familiar spirit is telepathic powers. A familiar spirit can come and transmit thoughts into your mind. And that thought, eh? can begin to germinate your mind and rule over your life. Especially if you don't know how to deal with it. I told them in Saria, I said, Christianity is a move of power. Without power, there's no Christianity. Jesus told them, he said, not many days from now, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. There are many things the Holy Ghost came to do. 
But the one Jesus pulled out was power. Because when power comes, every other thing can be achieved. He told them, tarry in Jerusalem, Luke 24, 49, until you are endued with power. It's not about the Bible, you know. You can go to a place. One of our friends went to Kogu State and he stood on the altar. The guy walks like this. So when the anointing is on him, the shoulders become brother. <laughs> and then when he stood, he stood on the stage, he quoted some scriptures, quoted some scriptures. And then he said he wants to judge this land. That there is evil, there is evil in this land. Suddenly, something hit him on the left side and he fell. <laughs> Have you seen a preacher fall on the pulpit before? <laughs> From that day till now, it's as if he has mental challenge. <laughs> you think you want to do the business of spirit without endowment? If a spirit doesn't empower you, that spirit has set you up. <laughs> Any spirit that sets you on errand and doesn't empower you, that spirit has set you up. So before you can do business for spirits, you must walk in the reality of their power. And there are seven four dimensions of the operation of the power of God. One of them is called supernatural assurance. You have assurance beyond the encouragement of people. You don't go to preach and then talk boldly because uh, somebody comes and tells you that ah, God will use you greatly in this meeting. Ah, when I was praying in the spirit, I looked into the heavens of God. And I saw an angel descend in the meeting. And as you stood and you were talking, the angel on the, li- on the right, light was coming out of his mouth. And people were falling under the power. Falling under the power. And then on the strength of that utterance, we now say this meeting will be great. Maybe the person was imagining. <laughs> you reign. <laughs> you ancient Zion's king. Kadosh. Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. Power, power. See, the economy of power is one of the most significant economy that you will ever interact with in the spirit realm. If you have not traveled into power, you have not started living. You are still a being manipulated grossly. You may not know. You may talk to talk big about yourself. Hey, the devil will allow you to go high before it, cra- it, it crashes you down. Power is the only thing you can build your life on. It is the sure foundation. It's called power. And the first dimension of the operation of the power of God is supernatural assurance. Jesus, they sent people to arrest him. They picked the guys went, they came back. They said, nobody speak like this man. They've never, never a man speak like this. The guy will stand up and say, as the living father has life in himself, so has he given to the son to have life in himself also. He didn't say his life came from, he said it's the same life that the father has in heaven now. That is the same life I have. Can you talk like that? <laughs> he said, God have mercy. God have mercy. God have mercy. Oh, mercy Lord. Oh, mercy Lord. Most of the prayer we pray is unbelief vocalized in words. As the living father has life in himself. So has he given to the son to have life in himself also. He said, no man taketh my life from me. I lay it down by myself and I take it up again. This commandment have I learned of the Father. You can't kill him. So when they came and carried stone, they would just laugh at them. The other time they carried him to the edge of the brick. They wanted to throw him. He allowed them, when they reached the edge, he now confounded them. He manipulated his constellations. And time became steel. And then the Bible says he walked, he walked through their midst. <laughs> Power! There is assurance in God. Apostle sent me to Zaria this weekend. There were over 4,000 people. I told them, I said, Zaria will scatter. The place will scatter. I said, I will set the place on fire. I have not gone to pray. There is assurance in God. It's not my prayer that will make it happen. It is part of my ordination. When I pray, I go to enforce the things that were written concerning me before the foundations of the world. Before I started representing Apostle, I'm a representative of Jesus Christ. I'm not come and say, ah, this shoe that I've come to wear is big. What shoe? I'm a representative of Jesus. 
If Pastor Tony sends me now and I can't go and I send you, is it me you are going to represent? If Pastor Tony you are going to represent, I couldn't run the errand, so I transferred it to you. And if I'm going to represent Jesus, I'm going the same way Jesus went. He said, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. If God is sending me different from the way He sent Jesus, it's unjust. And the Bible says God is not unjust. It's the same things he sent Jesus with that he's sending me with. As a man, Jesus walked with four advantages in life. The first is eternal life. The second is the Holy Spirit. The third is angels. And the fourth is faith. You have the four of them. Those were his advantages in life. You have eternal life. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the faith of the Son of God. And you have angelic ministry at your disposal. God can't send Jesus differently from the way he sent you. Or why will you do what Jesus says you do? Do you think you are an apostle because that's how you are before the war began? You are an apostle because you are a part of the extension of the dimensions of Jesus' ministry. The Bible says, who shall declare this generation? So it's what Jesus is doing, was doing that he handed over to you. It's the ministry of Jesus you are fulfilling. None of us has a ministry. It's the ministry of Jesus that was real to you. It's the same resources he has that you have. You need to have assurance. If you don't have assurance, demons will manipulate you. Have you gone for a meeting before you gave three words of knowledge? Nobody came out. If you don't have assurance, your soul will def- deflate. And the meeting will just scatter. Nothing will happen with that meeting again. Your soul will deflate. Demons, you are talking, the people know they are there, but they won't stand up. They want to stand up, something hold them down. If your assurance is in what you see happening, you are finished. If they like to they stand up or not, you keep talking. Have you gone for a meeting where you say, Holy Ghost, touch them. Nobody go under the power. People don't get blessed because they fail. People get blessed because we proclaim the blessing. And in our walls is the spirit of God. Whether they fall or they don't fall, the world enters their spirit. So your falling down does not validate what I'm doing. And my confidence is not in you falling down. My assurance is in God. You have challenges in life. And then you are crying every day. <sighs> what if demons begin to fight you? What if spirits are mobilized from hell and they say they will kill you? What will you do? Paul said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. If you are not strong in the Lord, you can't do business with power. It's what you have assurance in that will determine what you can wield in the spirit. That was why David rejected the armor of Goliath. He had confidence in God. When he came to Goliath, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defiled the armies of God? You know, when you talk like this, some people say you are proud. Meanwhile, they are the ones who are proud because they believe in their ability. You are talking because you believe in the ability of God that is at work in you. They who believe in their own ability are the ones who are proud. Your boast is in the Lord because you know it's not about you, it's about Jesus. So you talk based on the capacity of the God that is on your inside. They talk based on what they have done. I do a lot of fasting. There are times where I fast through the whole year, but I will never tell you it's because I fast that things happen. It's because of the perfect work of Jesus Christ, the perfect work of redemption. My fasting is to help my soul ascend in God. If my if my fasting can pay the price, Jesus wouldn't need to come. You need to have assurance in God. You need to have assurance in the, in the love of God. And your assurance is not based on the results. Have you heard apostle tell you here? That they say if you have results, if there is results, then it's accurate. It has nothing to do with results. Results are byproducts of intimacy with God. Byproducts of organic realities in the spirit. The Bible said in Habakkuk 3.17, it said, although the fig tree might not blossom, the fig tree might not blossom. There might be no fig on the vine. He said the field might fail. The neighbor of the only might fail. There may be no head in the store. He said, yet will I have confidence in the Lord. Whether something is happening naturally or not, I have confidence in the Lord. And I, I am joyed in the God of my salvation. Because he will cause my feet to be like hind feet and cause me to walk in my high places. Manifestation, beautiful. Without manifestation, I am still who I am in God. 
That's why a lot of people cannot see great things in God. They limit everything to themselves and you are very small. Maybe you have not checked where, you are very small. Check very well again, you discover you are very small. You are very small. If you see some beings in the spirit, you will faint. The spirits that are manipulating things in the constellation, if you see them, you will faint. A principality sat over Babylon and he had the whole nation spare bound. One principality called the Prince of Patience. Is that a being you want to fight? You don't know what you are talking about. Your confidence must be in God. That is why you must keep talking what God says. You are sick. Yes, you are sick. Yeah. They brought the best consultant from London. And he said nothing can be done about it. Well, he has tried his best. There is something else you know. He said, let no one in Zion say I'm sick. He said, by his stripes I'm healed. And you keep talking it to yourself until your mind can get it. Assurance in God. A lot of Christians don't have it. That's why they don't see the power. If there's no confidence, the power can't flow. Most don't have it. Forget the big things we say. It's when we see talent that we we'll know how strong we really are. You know, you can come for a meeting and say, The Lord will heal everybody here. You will be shouting it until you see a cripple. They are, they are pushing somebody, you know. Is that a crippled person? That when you see the cripple, you say, By the message of God, uh, things will happen. <laughs> There's no assurance in God. You keep building your faith. You keep exercising your faith. Who told you whether it failed will determine whether you are accurate or not? That it failed doesn't mean you are wrong. That it failed doesn't mean you are in error. Do you know how many patients die in the hospital every day? But it doesn't shake the confidence of the doctor. As far as he's concerned, if he can tell your, if he can diagnose your, if, 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 your, your sickness, he knows the drug has the power to deal with it. It's not about him. All he needs to do is to know what is wrong with you and then know the chemical that can deal with it. And then he sends the chemical into your body. If you die, that's not his problem. He's only a conductor of the operation. There's a challenge. All you need to do is to administer the word of God. Whether it works or not has nothing to do with you. Your job is to believe it. If a doctor gives you a pain reliever and the pain doesn't go, you say, ah, are you sure? Do like this, let me see. You shake your head. It's okay, you give you another pain reliever. As far as it's concerned, it's pain reliever that is the cure. And if you die in the process, and the next person comes, say, I have pain, it's the same drug you will give the person. And then even if three people die, the fourth person comes, say, I have pain, it's the same drug. If he diagnoses you for malaria, if there are hundred of you, it's the same drug he will give. If 99 dies, it doesn't change the prescription. That's confidence. Do you have assurance in God? No. You believe in things. So you came for meeting. You say, Lord, move! And then nobody fall. The next three meetings you go, Lord, we not move again. Supernatural assurance. You must train yourself to come to the point where you believe God. Most times when you have challenges, God that is the last alternative. And like Pastor Tony said, your heart is already hardened before you came there. You have come to a point where all you are seeing is death. That's when you want to apply God. It won't work. call it trust. It's not confidence. You actually didn't have a choice. If you have a choice, you apply it. So what most of us call faith or call confidence is actually a condition where we have no other choice. Psalm 
seven dimensions for the operation of the power of God. The second thing is what we call supernatural provision. When you do your budget and you plan, do you give space for God? And then when you run and nothing is there anymore, you start saying, I know my God will provide. I know my when you were planning, did you create space for God? You are now psyching yourself. Oh my God will provide. My God will provide. Do you believe God will provide? You see, the advantage of the Christian is the supernatural. Your advantage is the supernatural. It's not what you know. You are sent to all the world for God's sake. You go to some places, you meet only professors. What do you want to tell them? Your advantage is the supernatural. And you must always learn to maximize it. Apostles say you attend to your least potentials in the flesh. But unfortunately, most of us walk only by our potentials. It's only what you can create for yourself that you plan your life around. Somebody is planning for a whole month. He say, all I receive in the month is 10,000. So he reduces his life and the totality of his reality to 10,000. There's no window for God. No window for God. You give him 5,000. He will spend 10 naira today and he will calculate it so that he will have to give like that and live like that till the end of the month. There's no window for God. In Deuteronomy 8.18, he said, You shall believe in the Lord your God, for it is Him that giveth thee power. Power to get wealth. There is a power that is available in this kingdom for you to get wealth. Your expertise are beautiful. Your skill are beautiful. But beyond your skill, there is an influence of the Spirit of God that makes a difference. And if you don't take advantage of it, you will find yourself competing on the same scales with the unbelievers. And the one who is smarter than you will excel better than you. There's a system in the spirit that provides you supernaturally. You must acknowledge it, connect to it, and maximize it. He said, Woe unto the man that trusted in man. That is you inclusive. If your trust is yourself, your trust is in your father, your trust is in your uncle, you say you are woed. Woe unto that man. And he said, the moment you trust a man, something has happened that you are not aware of. He said, whose heart departed from the Lord. The moment you put your trust in a man, your heart has moved from God. You will not be aware. Woe unto that man. He said, he shall live in the patched places of the wilderness. He shall not see good when he cometh. Because good, sometimes when he comes to you, it is shrouded. You need the eye of the spirit to see it as an advantage. Abraham was trusting God for a child for 24 years. The day the child was coming, it came in the guise of three men strolling past his house. And he looked at them and said, Sars, Sars, come. Quickly, let him provide something for them. On their own accord, he said, the next time of life, your wife, Sarah, shall be with child. You trust in yourself, you can't see good when it comes. You will only see your efforts, and most of the times, your effort will not be sufficient. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and he shall perform the pleasures of your heart, the desires of your heart. There's a dimension of you that causes God to go to work on your behalf. Till tomorrow there is still supernatural supply. But if you allow yourself to come to a tight angle where you begin to trust God for it, you will be in trouble. The children of Israel lived in the wilderness for 40 years. The Bible says they lacked nothing. They lacked nothing. They lived supernaturally. Why do you budget and plan all your life based on your effort? How much can you do in the first place? And sometimes you don't take stock so you don't know how much God is already doing. And that is why God can't do much more. Some of you are students here, what you spend, if you take stock in the month, you'll be shocked. 
But there is a way you can train your spirit, train your mind, and you consciously begin to live like that. Your supply is in heaven. Jesus taught them to pray. Say, Our Father, who art in heaven? Who art in heaven? Is to tell you that your Father brings you supply from a realm that is beyond your realm. Every other thing you are doing is fine, but your advantage is in the spirit. The word Father is the word Pater in Greek. In Hebrew, it's the word Fundus. It means God is your sustainer, He's your nourisher, and He's your provider. But the God that provides for you does not provide from earth. He provides from heaven. So you must create a space in your mind where you trust God to provide beyond all your effort can give to you. You can't live based on all you can give to yourself. You will die. Somebody say hard work does not provide wealth. If not, the wheelbarrow pushers would have been the wealthiest people. There is supernatural supply in God. And it's by faith we connect with. You say, well, uh, if I say if I say it and it doesn't happen, what if it doesn't happen? All this while that you have not been saying it, has it been happening? So what is wrong in trying? At least build your faith. You think so much of failure that you keep yourself in perpetual failure. There's supernatural supply. And that's supposed to be the life of the believer. I'm coming to pray for the sick. You think I'm carrying healing in a basket? I need to learn to trust God that when that hour comes, He will provide healing. And the same thing is some what you apply to every area of your life. When the need comes, God will answer. Consciously build it. Consciously. Spiritual things are the most definite things and they are the most strategic things that you must do consciously. I was sharing with them when I went to minister at the College of Medicine last week Friday. You took six years to train as a doctor and you are still having errors, still having challenges. People are dying. But when it comes to, to spiritual things, you think it's a magic. You just say it, it happened. And then when it doesn't happen, you say these Christians, they are fake, they are fake. Why not do medicine for one week? You have to be on it. Be at it. And walk it until it comes out. The Bible says walk out your salvation. You keep at it until it begins to manifest. Thou shalt decree a thing it shall be established unto thee. You may say it ten times. It doesn't happen. Keep saying it. Paul said according as it is written. He didn't say according as they saw in the mountain. They saw in the spirit realm. Or according as men of stature. He said, according as it is written. They believe and have spoken. He said, we, having the same spirit of faith, we believe, therefore we speak. We are not speaking because we have stature. We are speaking because we believe. And what did we believe? What was written? It's what was written that he believed. And he kept speaking it. He said, the things that are written at four times, they were written for our learning. So that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That's why the Bible was written for you. It's not a story book. The guy did it, it happened. You do the same and it will happen. Because what makes it happen is the economy of faith. God is not a respecter of person. We don't practice. We think Christianity is not a life of practice. We think Christianity is a life of spontaneity. We think Christianity is a life of impulses. So you came for, for a meeting. That day they are praying. Then you begin. Kua, kua, shaka baba, hua, hua. And then because you think you throw the thing will happen. Have you not noticed that your mountains have always remained looking at you? It's not a matter of impulse. It's a practiced lifestyle. You give yourself to it. Before you do anything in this life that will give you desired result, your life must be spent on that thing. Ask to you for the past for the past six years. When last we had a three weeks break. One week at home is too long. It's too long. Even when the school gives them two weeks, they say no, no, we will take one week. No, no, no. What? Because for her to be a doctor, 
her life must be sacrificed on the altar. Nothing comes to the hands of a lazy man. You labor your way forward. He said, rise ye up. Take up thy journey and go beyond the river Anon. Behold, I have given unto you Sihon, the Amorite, king of Heshbon. He said, but begin to contend with him in battle. If you have given me the land, why do I need to contend? He said, oh, lie down. God will provide all my need. You will die there. You take advantage of it. You engage it with your mind. You engage it with your mouth. You engage it with your hand. Because if you lie down, you are a desolate being. He said, I will not allow you to take over the land in one day. Because the white beast will arise and devour you. God needs you to grow in capacity so that he can manage the things he gives to you. If you don't develop capacity, you can't manage. What he gives you will be a waste. Supernatural supply is a possibility in the spirit. It is replete in scriptures. Everywhere you read, you see supernatural supply. Either of the anointing of resources that is needed in life. You come to a Christian community, that's where you see the most beggarly people. And then we console ourselves and say, oh, we are going through a process. Oh, we are in the wilderness. The people that were in the wilderness for 40 years, it was because of their unbelief. The plan was not 40 years. The journey was a journey of 18 days. The idea was not 40 days. The reason it became 40 days was because they refused to believe God. God told them the land you are going to is a land flowing with milk and honey. They went, they were seeing giants. Was giant part of the citation? He said they are like grasshopper. He said they are a people of an evil heart. Because when you can't believe God, he sees your heart as evil. And he said, because you have said it to my hearing, I will give unto you as you have said. Every day will become one year. If you read Exodus to Deuteronomy, you will discover they were walking around the mountain. They were not going anywhere. You will see them come to Horeb. Go around again for another year. Come to Horeb. It's the same place. I wonder why they didn't know that it's the same route they were following. <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, they were bound to walk to follow the Holy Spirit. Because what you call wilderness is actually a product of unbelief. It's a Holy Ghost stagnation, according to Reverend Hughes. A Holy Ghost stagnation to correct your heart. Did you not see Jesus? Carried people to the mountain for three days. And in the evening, he said, uh, What do you have to eat? Carelessly. Ah, the people came. Ah, are you being serious? This place is far from town. We have been here for three days. Are you not aware we've not eaten anything for three days? Is it now you are now waking up to ask what we have to eat? Well, we can't give them anything to eat. He said, you give them something to eat. Are you alright? Even a whole year's wage can't feed these people, sir. What are you? Are you are, are you still here? He said, what do you have? When they saw that the man was not thinking from their realm, all they had was two fishes and seven loaves. They said, okay, since you talk like a madman, take what we have here. Let's see how it will serve 4,000, 5,000 men. And they gave thanks. There was no plan. There was no budget. He came with God. The Bible says he gave thanks. And he broke it. He said, give them. The person that collected it from his hand, I wonder how the person was thinking. Give who? Who are the them? Only few loaves. He said, who are they? Where do I start from? Even with the apostles, will this one be enough for us? Okay, let me give them with myself first. <laughs> and as they broke it, it multiplied. As they broke it, it multiplied. A point came with they were in the ship with Jesus. And Jesus said, be careful of the unleavening of the Pharisees. And they began to talk among themselves. Maybe he's asking for bread. And Jesus was vexed. He said, why are you of an evil heart? He called them an evil generation. He said, did you not remember the 5,000 men and the two loaves and uh, the two fishes and five loaves? Did you not remember the 7,000 men? Why are you still talking about bread? Jesus needed them to understand that there's an economy in the spirit that provides supernaturally. And he expected them to believe in it. Jesus was vexed that at this level they could not believe in supernatural supply. Why would you still be talking about bread? We have a handful, we fed 5,000 men. And you are still talking about what, what is wrong with you? And that's how most of us are. 
You had in school fees, you were crying. And school fees came from nowhere. And then the next day you have a need. And then you are crying as if there is no God. Where was the God that helped you when you needed school fees? Is that God dead? Or has he lost his capacity? You need to understand the economy of supernatural supply. Spirits are excited when you can rely on them. That's why one of the names of God is El Shaddai. He wants you to know him as the supplier. He's among God when it comes to supplies. Cast your cares upon him. That's what they like. They like it when you cast your cares. Because they have capacity. The third dimension is supernatural protection. If you don't know these things and exercise your mind consciously, you may think Christianity is about euphoria, excitement. You feel it's about the, the intrigue of the present. They say, Holy Ghost. Oh, oh, oh. And then you see some angelic dance. They will do angelic dance like Tai Chi. When you have crisis, angelic dance will not help you. This is not, this is not a bead to talk down anybody. Me too, I have those experiences. Sometimes in my room, the power of God turns me up and down. I fall down and I weep for hours. We all have the experiences. But I'm telling you that there is a place beyond that. You need to come to a place where you know that me, me, I know go die for road. You, you tell yourself. See, sometimes you need to tell yourself. Tell, oh my God, my kete is here. Thank God. I will not move in power again. Thank God. This man walks with open heaven. So you are set up now. I move free. Hey. You don't know if they de- if demons if demons put you in high on high jump. I can't die. I cannot. Me, I can't. You you tell yourself you can't. Because why? Why can't you die? Because he that is with the Lord. Did you not hear it? Even if the whole hair gather together against me, they can't get me. Ah. Chief don't raise the scripture. He said, gather together. You shall scatter. Take counsel together. It shall come to know. Speak the word. It shall not stand. Why? Because our God is in our midst. If they like, let the whole villagers. You know, sometimes if you don't understand when they are talking about deep things in the spirit, you may begin to make wrong assumptions. The reason we take time sometimes to explain to you the things the devil do is so that you don't come to a point where out of ignorance you set yourself up. Because most of the things you say, they empower spirits. That's why most times you hear, they tell you things about ancestral patterns and the rest. It's not to, it's not to put you in bondage. It will let you know that these possibilities are there. And when you know they are there, you will stand on your guard. It's not designed to put you back in slavery. Where you call, you say, uh, maybe it's the people fighting from my village. Fighting with village. Who are the people? My destiny began from the cross. Me, my past died on the cross. And I don't care what you believe. I don't care your theology. Any spirit that comes to me, where are you coming from? He paid the price for a full package and I received it. You can't come and intimidate me with it. If you like, call the names of 500 ancestors. I'm not moved. I began from God. He said, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So everybody that comes to God is reconciled to him. I belong to God. And so I have assurance that he's jealous over me. Why you see, why, what do you think is the confidence of the pastor? When you want to travel and you come and meet the pastor. And he say, go, you shall be preserved. You think it's because he has stature? It's because he knows God says so. And God is committed to his word. He believes it, you don't. The day you believe it, you stop going to the pastor to pray for you before you travel. My confidence is in the Lord. I've discovered that where you see the highest number of babes is in prophetic ministries. 
there, there are only two mature believers there. One is the prophet, the other one is his wife. Every other person wrote to them. Papa, 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 Papa. People who cannot fast and pray for three days, they will lie on the veranda for three weeks, waiting for the prophet to come and say, Ah, it's where, it's where, it's where. He will wait for three weeks for the prophet. It's where, it's where. You are a babe. Go and get pampas in the spirit and wait. He said, when ye ought to be teachers, you have need of being taught the first principles of the oracles of God. He says, strong meat, it belongs to them who by reason of use have exercised their senses. The key word is exercise. If you don't exercise your senses, you will never grow. Walking with milk and, 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 and pampas in the spirit realm. Think that you are in church for 30 years, you are mature. Most of, most of the people are pampas Christianity. Pampas Christian. Pampas wearing Christian. Say prophet, prophet, prophet. Son. Ah, prophet. Sometimes when the prophet is passing, they will just come and hold his shoe and put their head on the shoe for five minutes. And then they will break you free his prophetic action. It's because they are living with ignorant people. If a man has understanding, that thing will disdain him. It's not of God. Supernatural protection. You grow. You come to a level where people can come under your own atmosphere. Because they are connected to you, things can happen to them. Did you not notice? When they, the battle of the kings, when they took Lot, Abraham didn't go to consult with God. When they told him they carried Lot, he said, what? He carried 318 trained servants in his house. He went after five kings. It doesn't matter their number. The guy knows that for him, heaven will move to ensure that no one hair of his head falls to the ground. Men grow, they come to a point of strength. The Bible spoke about Joshua. This guy has protected Israel to a level where neighboring kingdoms, they come to beg him to protect them. The children of Gibeon were to be slain. And when they said to Joshua, don't worry, go and relax, we are coming. The guy came and destroyed the Amalekites and the Assyrians. He destroyed them until it was getting late and a man stood and said, he said, let the sun stand upon Gibeon and let the moon remain on the valley of Ajalon. And the Bible said the sun hastened not to go down for a period of a whole day. You may not know the implication of that scripture. It is not given to man to manipulate the constellations. The authority you have has nothing to do with the constellations. In Job chapter 38 verse 31 to 33, the Bible says, can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? He said, or lose the bands of Orion. He said, can you comfort Maseroth? Or can you charge Arcturus and his son? Those are constellations. It's not in the region of men to command constellations. That's what God was saying. He said, do you know the ordinances of heaven? Or how they are established? Their dominion are established on the earth. Men don't have power to command the constellation. But a man grew in a place of assurance. That for him, heaven will move. And he stood and said, let the sun stand. He said, let the moon stand. And the Bible said, there has never been a day like that. There will never be a day like that in the day that God hearkened to the voice of a man. If you dare to believe a spirit, you will see wonders. The reason you don't see things happening in your life is because you don't dare. Pastor Chris, you him and say, put God on the stage. He will not let you down. You come from, I was in Zaria on Saturday. Oh no, on Sunday morning. When I, the power of God was moving. I commanded sicknesses. When I called for testimony, people came out. A crowd of people came out that were healed. I said, if you are sick in the congregation, lift your hand. And people, a lot of people still lifted their hands. I said, what? All of you, come outside. You will be healed now. It's not go come. And if you are not healed, tell me here. Let God embarrass me. If he sent me to Zaria to embarrass me. You will be healed now. Me, I know I believe. And we prayed for them. They were healed. I touched one guy like this. He was under the power for 24 hours. And that's the second time it is happening. I was in, in, in Lafayette for NCCF State Conference last two weekends. I was ministering around 12 a.m. in the morning. The power of God hit a lady. 
they brought the lady to me around 11 30 the morning after my morning session because i had two sessions midnight and morning she was still shaking under the power of controlling me i came as a man of statue i said I call, let the influence reduce let it reduce let it reduce oh boy the lady was still shaking under the power and i said don't worry god is doing something <laughs> Allow the Holy Ghost. Allow the Holy Ghost. When he finished what he's doing, <laughs> that lady was under the power until I came to Matodi the next day. She was under the power of God for 28 hours. But if you tell me now, go and release the power of God to somebody, and then I'll start thinking in my heart, how can this thing happen? Can it not happen? There's no assurance. That day will never come again. I believe in the power of God. And the power of God is not just for people to be slain. It's that same power that protects you. He said, even if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you shall fear no evil. Why? Because the Lord is with you. Your confidence is not because you are a mighty man. The Lord is with you. Walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You can come to a circumstance in your life where everybody give hope, give up hope. It doesn't matter. The Lord is with you. Have you come to a point where you trust God? When I travel, most times I sleep. That's why I can travel for seven hours and go straight and begin to minister. Most of my long meetings, I travel that day. I will just the other time I went, they just carried me from the park. I didn't shower. I went straight to the altar. After traveling for seven hours, because when I'm traveling, I sleep throughout. People will shout, "Hey, blood of Jesus!" I don't know what they are saying. <laughs> After all, the beauty of life is not how long you live. It's the impact. And I'm on my way to make impact. So if I die, it's a beautiful death. Instead of lying on my bed and die, then they say he slept in the Lord. I better die on the mission field. <laughs> Let me die on the mission field. So that it will be on record that I was battling with Satan. And the person that the anointing will fall on will be a warrior. Because the person who went down was a warrior. trust God. Believe God for God's sake. Believe this thing we are doing. That's why I tell people don't be religious. Stand and be worshipping God. If the power of God has not taught you worship God and go home. It doesn't happen because you fell down. Most of us, most of the time we fall, we fall religiously. That's why we don't believe in the power of God. If the power of God taught you, you can't doubt it. You are praying in your room, your hand begins to shake. You try to stop it, it's shaking. You hold an iron, you hold your chair, it's shaking. You know there's something on your hand. You are not acting. Something is on your hand. A point came. God said, mind the things you touch. Because my power is invested in your right hand. I know there's power here. Sometimes when I decree and things don't happen. I go and begin to touch the people. Because this one God told me there's power here. So if I can't conduct power with my words. There's one that he told me. You can't doubt it. Why every time you do like this. Ha! You fall and you know it's religion. When you have crisis, you can't believe. But if you know the power of God works in you, when there's a circumstance, you channel it. You channel it. You channel it. You know that's your advantage. He said they will kill you. Say me? Do you know me? I'm born of God, brother. I'm not. A, I'm, this, I'm not from this world. Jesus was walking on earth. He said the Son of Man, which is in heaven. The guy had. He was, he was bilocating. He lives in two places at the same time. If you want to attack here, the one in heaven will superimpose. You know me? I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. Do you know who you are talking to? You can't kill me. You can't. I will not die and say, thank God I died. No, you can't. I will war with you. The Jesus, me I know is the lamb of the tribe of Judah. You may know the lamb. Me I know the lion. You can't kill me. You can't kill me. Have assurance in God, brother. They say, who are you? You begin to shake like this. The Pharisees came with their intimidating look. And they say, who are thou? And John said, I'm the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. I, how dare you? You want to say you are the one that forfeit Isaiah prophecy? Yes, I'm the one. I'm the one. It's me, not me. You see like this, not me. <laughs> okay, why are you baptizing people? The one that sent me, the same said unto me, 
the one upon whom the spirit has a light upon and wait is the chosen one. I came baptizing because it's a strategy to identify the Messiah. I'm in business with God. Some of you may brag that I know the governor. I don't have that time. I do business with God. When you have such assurance, people will say you are a proud man, I assure you. But you can't talk from the realm of God and not be seen as proud. Some people came listening to Apostle and they say, Kai, 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 this guy is proud. They don't know. They think he's talking like them. People who the assurance is their uncle who is working in Chevron. And every time they talk, my father is a politician. Oh God, I'm talking from heaven. So you can't, you can't relate with me. My assurance is beyond everything you know. And it doesn't matter if I'm trekking. You may not even be seeing the result now. But I'm not talking based on result. Is that thing I'm talking that will produce the result? God is your protector. He's called Jehovah Sabaoth. The God of hosts. He comes with an entourage of the angelic. He's called Jehovah Ra. The God of war. That's who protects you. And just in case it looks as if nothing works, all I need to do is to talk. He said he confirmed the words of his servants and he performed the counsel of his messenger. If I talk, even if not, if even if I'm not inspired, it's the words of his servant he confirms it. Believe in the protection of God. It's a dimension of the power of God. The power of God is not falling down. Most times God overwhelms you because he wants to do something in your life that your distraction won't let him. The power of God is a tangible thing. You are sick, it's time to channel the power of God. You are poor, it's time to channel the power of God. The fourth dimension. I, I don't have time. There's no time now. Maybe we'll just leave the tree so that we can minister to the sick. I'll just mention it. Go and do your research. The fourth dimension is supernatural wisdom and insight. You want to build your life and the system, what you need is the power of God that works as wisdom. He said, true wisdom is an house built. And by understanding, it is established. Through knowledge, the chambers are filled. If you are doing something and it's not working, you lack understanding. You need a power called wisdom. Wisdom. The Bible says it is the principal thing. It says, get it. And in all that getting, get understanding. Those are tangible ways of, dying, of, of, of operating in God. Young people nowadays, we are so proud and proud over nothing. You are praying, you are ministering to 10 people in four months. None of them have seen any promotion anywhere. And every day we come, we do like this, they fall down. We do like this, they fall down. And we say, oh boy, we have power. The guy who can't get admission can't get it. The person who can't marry can't marry. The guy who is sick is sick. He say you are full of power. You are a apostle of power. It's self-deception. Your power has no proof. There's no pragmatism to your power. You can't impart on existential realities. When you pursue God, pursue God for tangible things. Thank God for what He's doing because we are not the ones making it happen. But there's more in God. People are slain. Glory to God. I'm not the one making it happen. I don't even know how it happens. I just see people falling and shouting. But there is more in God. The guy that came to me did not come to fall down. He came because he has cancer. She came because she's buried. She came because she can't get married. If there is power, it will address that thing. Because that's the reason I'm ministering to her. And you must begin to practice it as a believer. Because these operations are not for men of God. They are for the believers. He said, go into all the worlds. Disciple all nations. And you may think discipleship is just to teach them about the ways of God. Power is part of the ways of God. Teach the people that there is a way to live supernaturally. He said they went boldly. Speaking the word of God. And the word, the Lord confirming his word with signs and wonders. Isaiah said, I and the children the Lord has given me. We are for signs. We are for wonder. If you were in his generation, he says, see the, imagine this proud man. So because you can give one or two words of knowledge. You know, when you quote this scripture, you don't take time to reason the context. Those of you who are in Bible school, they will teach you hermeneutics. 
and you see laws of biblical interpretation, it will help you to see the scripture better. He said, Tell Zacharias, him and the men that sit with him, they are men that are greatly wondered at. It's not men trying to make people feel they are supernatural. People wonder at them. Because everything they do has a supernatural sphere. Others may be talking when you rise to talk. People, this is a supernatural thing. I heard a story about my sister here. They say in the College of Mercy, if you, if you don't go for one round for one week, there's a high tendency that you'll fail that course. In fact, when they see you, they'll pursue you. And here is this sister. She left for America and spent one month. And then she was snappy in America. And then the lecturers were liking it. Meanwhile, if you don't go for world round for one week, what will happen? We will fail the course. When she came back, she passed. Other people that went for world round throughout, some of them failed. You can't explain it. There's a supernatural thing at work in your life. That's what makes the difference. And if you don't have the mentality, you will live beggarly and you think you are pleasing God. <laughs> you know, some people, when they act poor, they think they are pleasing God. They will just be acting humble and they are pleasing God. You don't know how God talk. Go and read the Bible again. Every time Jesus speaks, highlight it. Then when you finish highlighting everything Jesus said, go through only the things Jesus said again. And then you understand that kings don't beg. Jesus doesn't know how to talk small. He comes, they bring the sick, he said, be healed. They bring somebody who is a sinner, I say, your sins be forgiven you. And the people say, what is this man? This blasphemy, what is he saying? That's how kings talk. He said, where the word of the king is, there is power. Who can see unto him what dwells thou? You can't tell me anything. And humility for me is not an act. It's a life of God walking out through me. So I will tell you what the Bible says. But I know that I need to be humble before God. There are two different things. Timidity is not humility. So, supernatural protection. He says he causes his angels to encamp around his people. Do you know that angels walk around you constantly guiding you? The Bible said even the children that don't know their left from their right, he said their angels stand before God every day. And people don't, yet believers don't have, they don't have assurance about anything. You want to travel from here to Abuja, you need to, There are many things you shouldn't pray about. The energy you emit from your soul, we handle it. As you are coming to the road, you are coming like, like a bulldozer. Every demon will clear. They will clear. Because you have told yourself that if they try anything, if they try it, they will be expelled from the earth realm. The energy that you are emitting. You know, spirits interact with your thoughts. A car just hit gallop. Your mind, ah, ah, ah. It will take the next five minutes to gather yourself again. You didn't know you have made a statement in the spirit realm. The beings have seen fear traffic from your soul. Pastor Chris said when he was learning how to walk in healing, if he hit his leg on a stone by mistake, he's not thinking of what to say. But because he has, he kept telling himself, I can't be sick. I can't. I can't. Sometimes you'll be in the room when he, when the anointing is strong on him, he say, I can't be sick. I, you think he's fighting with somebody. When you put your ear, it's dropped. Then you hear him telling himself, I can't be sick. A point came when if he hit his leg on the stone by accident, he said, be healed. It's not, oh Jesus, be healed. The mind has been trained. He has trained his mind. He has exercised himself to discern. When they came back from a mission field, and the wife said, they, they, their cousin doctor had already diagnosed and said, ah, this thing is Mikari. He said, no, it can't happen. And the Bible, he said, I want to say the Bible. He said, there was no secret prayer. No, it can't happen. It's not because it's way really cool. He has trained himself like that. The area you exercise yourself is the area of your strength. They went for a meeting in Liberia. It was falling continuously for six days. The meeting was to start the next day. He came outside and stood. He said, if one drop of rain fall from heaven, let fire fall. They were there for days. The cloud was dark as if it was night. Not one drop. Not one drop. 
They came back the last night and they being a tall black object left the room. He said, eh? So the devil came here to wait. This night, let nobody pray. Nobody should pray this night. Shame on Satan. <laughs> you program your mind. The day the challenge will come, it will be bigger than you. If you don't build your faith to tame the mountain, the day you collide with the mountain, you will faint. And he said, if you faint in the day of trouble, it's because your strength is small. Not because God is not there. And if you like, go and say, God, you don't exist. Why? Why? There's no answer. There's no answer to your why. If you want to know why, check the scriptures and build your faith. That's where the answer to why is. You reign. You ancient Zion king. Kadosh. Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. There's no time. You reign. You ancient Zion king. Kadosh. Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. That's what we call supernatural speed. Supernatural speed. See, they can be doing it before you came. It don't matter. The Bible said the hand of God came upon Elijah. He outran the chariots of Ahab onto Jezreel. It's called supernatural speed. It doesn't matter what they were doing. When you come, the rules will change. He said the years that the canker worm has eaten, the years the caterpillar worm has eaten, the Lord has a system of restoration. It's called supernatural speed. It doesn't matter when the guy gave his heart to Christ. Maybe he was in Christ for 30 years before he began to prophesy. There's a system in God. It's called supernatural speed. When you come tomorrow, you will prophesy. It's speed. There's what we call supernatural favor. Five people can come for the interview, they bounce them. Your case is different because we walk by different set of rules. I don't want to know how many people the person bounced. My case is different. I admit it from my mind. I know it like I know my name. My case is different. I don't follow the rules that men set. I walk by the laws of heaven. If they go the rich among you, they shall entreat thy favor. Israel was in captivity for 430 years. And then the next thing Moses come. And he said, go and tell the Egyptian to give you their gold. What do you mean? These are the people torturing us for 430 years. How can we go and tell them to give us their gifts? And the Bible said the Israelites spoiled the Egyptians. Because an economy was activated. It's the law of supernatural thing. They said people don't go there. They don't allow people. Not my case, brother. Not me. Not me. Not me. You know the only thing I look out for? I just want to make sure I'm in the center of God's will. Because if I am there, I'm dangerous. I was preach, I've been preaching for about 13 years. God never told me to give anybody my message or do anything. I'll go and preach. I don't even collect the message. In 2018, December, the Holy Ghost came and told me, He said, I want to begin to announce it. And then by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he said, cut out portions of your message. And I cut out six messages. Five minutes, six minutes. I cut them the Puritan capsule. When I put it on my telegram, in 11 days, the message went to seven nations of the world. It's called supernatural speed. Seven nations of the world. There were five minutes. On the 14th day, somebody called me from Tulsa, Oklahoma. In United States of America and gave me an invitation to come and minister in August. He said a friend sent my, my clip to him from Turkey. Those 13 years, God said, Stay here. But when he begins to announce you, go out with audacity because the one that sent you, he said, Go in this might. People were opening YouTube pages, uploading the messages. This message I'm preaching now, if I put it, in three days, you will see 5,000 views. I don't know them. I've received calls from close to 10 nations of the world in 32 days. It's supernatural.
supernatural speed. Be audacious about your destiny. Your acting gentle will not help you. You will only get the people praise you and say you are humble. Your destiny will perish. Paul said, if I be a servant of men, I'm not the servant of God. Some of you do things so that men can applaud you. It's a waste of life. Be in the center of God's will and follow his instructions. And when you do it, do it with audacity. Do it with confidence. I'm not saying go and be arrogant. I'm saying stand on the word of God. Whatever God tells you, stake your heart to it. Stake your life to it. It's not unjust to let you die. You win. I'm going to minister to the sick in five minutes. And I'll tell you how we'll do it. I've shown you how to exercise your, your dominion and your authority. I'll call my friend Michael Tse to come up and give us a song in the next three minutes. After that, this is how we are going to do it. When I sense the anointing moving, the people who are sick, those standing next to them, will begin to minister to them. And then you will see strange things here. That is when you will realize that it's not about men, it's about God. Michael, yes, let me set you up today. I'm on the mic. Five minutes. Let him, you know, this man walks with open heaven. How many people are sick here? Can you wave? You don't need to tell us what's wrong with your with you. You know, read the Bible for yourself. Jesus never asked anybody what is wrong with you. The Bible says he healed those that had need for healing. Don't bother about what's wrong with them. The power of God is intelligent. How many people are sick? Let me see your hand. Look around you. Look around you. If somebody is sick, you will minister to him. You are his partner. Sister, you will minister to him. Bro, you will minister to her. Dijala, minister to him. Man of God, you will minister to him. And then when they pray, we will find out if you are healed. Now, it's about the power of God. It's not about a man. Mama, you will minister to her. Sister Anne, you will minister to her. Sister, minister to her. You, minister to her. If you don't know what to say, say be healed in Jesus' name. Who else? Bro, minister to her. Bro, minister to that brother. So after my can say ministers, you minister to him. If the atmosphere is charged, then we'll begin our ministrations. Some of us who don't have people to minister to will begin to worship. Sir, let's fly. We cry out, Kadosh. See you are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion's king. We cry out, Kadosh. See you are mighty on your throne. Break forth. If all this of the deep cry out, God, us. You are mighty on your throne. Judah, you are mighty. 
sealed your throne. The resurrected one. You are the spirit of worship. And the resurrected one. You are the spirit of worship. El Gipo. El Riot. And El Diot. Elohim, we pray for her to worship you. Oh, 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 The spirit of worship, you are glorious beyond this creation. You are the spirit of worship. We cry. You are my healer, you are my keeper, my restorer, my life giver. You are the living God. Go ahead and begin to minister to them. Yes, there is no one. You are supposed to minister to somebody. Begin to minister to them now. I am a cope. Begin to minister to them now. Minister to them now. Go ahead. 
Take over. You don't need to distract them from their spirit. Take over. You must lay hand on their hands. Take over. Take over. Spirit, take over. I cannot do it by myself. Ah, Holy Spirit, take over. Take over. Holy Spirit, take over. I cannot know you by myself. Hallelujah. Listen. This is not a bid to break scriptural provision. The Bible said the less is blessed of the greater. This is not a blessing. This is people carrying out prophetic instructions. That was why John the Baptist went ahead and baptized Jesus. Even though Jesus had no stature. It is a present revelation position of the spirit. You are sick in your body now. Those who are supposed to minister to them, just hold their hands. You must put up on their head. Begin to pray. Make declarations. Release the healing power over them now. The power of God is about to begin to fall. Those of you who are not even being prayed for. As the man of God minister now, the power of God will begin to rest on people. The power of God will begin to rest on people. Anna shot ten and broke.
Just lift your hands toward heaven now. Open your heart. I want to transfer the healing anointing. You catch it in your heart. You catch it in your heart. Holy Spirit. Men must rise that we carry virtue into their worlds. Virtue, tangible virtue. We travel now to preach in places we don't know the people. We don't know the doctrine they believe. So it takes an anointing to break through the yoke. And we see results that overwhelm us. Some of us traveled in pursuit of the anointing because we knew it is not a way of psychic men. It's a tangible thing. I pursue the men that have it in order to get it. I've received the partition from Reverend Chris Akilo. I've received the partition from Apostle Arum Osa. I've received the partition from Benny He. He said, freely you have received, freely give. I'm not trying to psych you. I will pray for you. You go and pray for the sick and you see things happen. I was in Lagos for an class meeting. I knelt in his front. He laid hands on me. He said, walk in the glory realm. So when we have audacity to enter dark places, we know we have received something from the Lord. You may not need to travel in search of Pastor Chris, travel in search of Paul Lencher, travel in search of Benihim. It's an economy, a system in the spirit. When a man has something, he can give to others. He say a man cannot give except the things he received from the Lord. So when you receive, it's your responsibility to give it. So that kingdom can be advanced. Most of you that we receive, you will walk in dimensions we can't imagine. Because there is a room for overtaking in the spirit. And different people are crafted differently. Just ask the Lord for an anointing. Ask the Lord for the anointing. Ask the Lord for the anointing. Some of you are sick. Your family members are sick. Brethren are sick. It's time to begin to minister him. Thank you, Father. The hour has come. Don't miss out. Don't pray anymore so you don't distract yourself. Jesus came to Jerusalem. He lamented over the people. He said, because thou knowest not the times of thy visitation. You can miss out on your hour. Even Jesus himself can't help you. Precious Holy Spirit. This is the confidence that we have in you. That when we ask, you hear us. And if you hear, then we know we receive the petition for which we have asked. Father, stretch your hands now. And begin to anoint. Anoint, Lord. Anoint the hands of people with the healing oil. Anoint the hearts of men. Touch, Holy Spirit. Man, Nebraska. Help the brother so that we keep it calm. Touch! Holy Spirit, measures of the Spirit, dimensions in God, possibilities in the Spirit, I release it upon you. Don't be distracted. Why are you looking at the person God is walking on? I just want to be where you are. Touch! As your heart approaches God now, the oil will begin to flow. The oil, it will begin to flow. Some of you are people that never imagined that God will use you for anything. It's an anointing. It's an anointing. It flows in your direction. Michael, help me now. I the oil. Just wanna be where you are. All you need to do is to ask the Lord. Dwelling daily in your presence. Breathe on them, Holy Spirit. Take me to the place Shabbat where Shabbat. you are. The power of God. Hey. I just want Angel to be with you. 
God is transferring gifts now. Virtues. If you are sensitive, I just want to be you will sense it on your body like electricity. You, you will sense it. Literally. In your dwelling place forever. Take me to the place where you are. Holy Spirit. I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. In your dwelling place. You need that. Forever. You need that. You need that. You need that. Take me to the place. Where you, you don't do it with your abilities. I just want to be where you I just want to be where you are be your dwelling place forever. Take me to the place where you are. I just want to be with you. I just want to be where you are. Dwelling daily in your presence. Take me to the place where you are. I just want to be with you. We need empowerment. Be where you are. There are spirits threatening our existence. Dwelling in your presence. Spirits. He's the natural table Surrounded by your glory In your presence That's where I always want to be And those under the power I just want to be I just want to be with you. Let your brother take me to the place where you are. In your dwelling place forever. Take. I don't want to worship from afar. Take! For me need to wait. So we wait on you. A prophetic spirit. Lord, we wait on water. you. We wait on you. Lord, we wait on you. We wait on you. Lord, we wait on you. Yeah, we wait on you, Lord. Lord, we wait on you. You wait on you. Yeah, Lord, we wait on you. Sweet Holy Spirit. We wait on you, Lord. We wait on you. You are Yahweh. 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 You 
The brother is not known. Couldn't find we don't know him. He is just part of the believers in the body of Christ. Check yourself if you have been healed. Send in the testimony. We don't have time. As you came forward now, just lift your hands and give thanks to God. Yours may have started. The process continues. As you give thanks, it comes to fruition. Hallelujah. Nobody is greater than you. Nobody great, nobody great, say nobody great, nobody greater than you. Nobody great, yes, one more. Nobody greater than you. One more time, nobody great, yeah, nobody great. Nobody great. Nobody great. The presence of God has been so strong. The move of the Spirit, the move of His power. I will instruct us for a few minutes and then we'll take time to pray. But by all means, ask the Lord to release faith in your direction. Ask the Lord to suffice you with much of Himself. So that you will live here change, you will live here change forever. You who reign, you ancient Zion skin, Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. I want to thank all the leadership. You are doing a great and an awesome job. And um, you may not understand the strategic nature of what you are doing because the scope of what you are doing is not just about the people you are affecting. It's about the vacuum you are feeling in the spirit realm. Most times, the reason ministries are born is not just because it is captured within the context of ordination. Most times, the reason ministries are born is because there are vacuums in the spirit that many have not reason to occupy. So the corporate purpose of God cannot be fulfilled. So when the man is fulfilling the ministry, it's natural for him to judge the significance of his ministry by the work he's seen on ground. But if God wants to really show you the import of your ministry, he will show you the transgenerational move of God. That's when you would understand the scope and the impact of your ministry. For example, 
The ministry of John the Baptist did not last for a very long time. The Bible said he was in the wilderness in Luke 180 until the day of his showing forth unto Israel. And the moment John emerged, he began to cry. Not too long from then, Jesus showed up. And immediately you hear that I must decrease while he increases. So the scope of his ministry was very short. But in the spirit realm, when Jesus was giving credence to the quality of his ministry, he said, no man born of a woman has been like John. He said he's the greatest of all of them that have existed because of the strategic nature of his ministry. So oftentimes, it's natural for us to judge what we are doing by the location and by the people we are affecting. But until God shows you the calendar of heaven, you will not know how strategic you are. So this morning, we want to begin by quickly acknowledging the labors you have put on ground. And we ask that the Lord will cause it to increase and to be on a progressive rise in the name of Jesus Christ. And for those of us who are here, there will be sessions of impartations, there will be sessions of healings. But I want you to know that what God wants to do with you is beyond healing. It's beyond, beyond what you will receive from God. God wants to recruit this generation because of the move that is already in progress. This phase is very significant. I am emphasizing the times so that the things I will share this morning will make meaning to you. Not every moment is the same in the calendar of God. There are certain seasons that are Kairos moments. And for a Kairos moment, as short as it is, it is what gives value to the Kronos moment. A farmer may spend the whole season planting, watering, and watching over the seeds. But the time of harvest is what gives relevance to his labor. So the time of harvest becomes more significant than every other moment. Because if he fails in the time of harvest, he has lost everything that he labored for. So Jesus entering Jerusalem, in Luke chapter 19 verse 44, the Bible said he lamented over the city. He said there will be gnashing of teeth. He said no stone shall be left unturned. Why? He came because thou knowest not the times of thy visitation. Jerusalem, the great city of the kings, Jesus said it will be crushed. It will be cool. The reason is because they've not discerned the times of their visitation. There are many times when God comes and all he does is that he brings a whisper into your heart. That whisper becomes the instruction for your destiny. You may have attended many meetings, met many men of God, received many impartations, but that whisper that God brings to your heart is the blueprint of your destiny. If you miss it, every other meetings, every other impartation, every other study of the word of God might be a waste. This is why every time we come into the presence of God, it's important to discern what the move of God is for that time. But a lot of believers are not aware. I have traveled for many meetings. I have journeyed to many men of God and I have met many great preachers. But a point came, I realized that discerning seasons is one of the most cardinal essence of our work with God. It defines our work. It defines our value. And it gives credence to our callings and ordinations. Tonight, I want you to be aware that this season is a recruitment season. Most times we come for meetings like this, people want us to stay everywhere while they shout. But the instructions they neglect is what will make them important. I was talking with somebody earlier this yesterday. And the point we raised was, we have revival meetings, of course. Glory to Jesus. But I was sharing with someone and then we said, how did we become what we have become? It's by the progressive instructions that we have received and our compliance to those instructions that have changed our stories. Hallelujah. So this morning, if we don't discern the seasons, we may take things for granted. We may want the service to be as usual, have the same experiences we always have, do the same things we always do and go back the same things we do every time. 
we leave meetings like this and we will not make the most of it. Personally, I believe that transformation is the most important dimension of God that a believer can domesticate. Becoming like God. Every other thing follows it. Personally. So most times, my burden is to have people transform. And tonight, I'll be sharing a few things with you that will stir a hunger in your spirit and will cause a transformation in your life so that you become relevant eternally with God. You may be anointed, you may not be significant. You may be popular, you may not be significant. You may organize great meetings, you may still not be significant. This is why some when you study Bible characters, the doctrines you have received, the teachings you have received, the lives of this man begins to contradict those teachings. Because you don't understand why a man who was in the wilderness all his life, who came out probably for a year or two, becomes more important than prophets that call down fire from heaven. You know, you don't understand why a man who was at the backside of the wilderness, not known, having no status among men, the Bible said he dressed in camel skin, he fed on honey and locust. How can such a man whose ministry did not span for up to three years, how can that man be more important than every other prophet that have lived before him? Ordinations, assignments, accuracy, and precision with God. It's important for a generation. To discern their Kairos moments. That is when the dealings of God in your life will be important. You may not discern the importance of the dealings of God in your life. You may not know why you started with everybody. It's as if everybody has gone ahead of you. And you are in that spot. And nothing is making sense in your life. Until you begin to discern the seasons of your life. You begin to discern the weight of your ordination. Your dealings cannot make sense to you. Until you know the seasons of God over your life, even the location where God plants you will not make sense to you. This morning, I want to share with us I'm taking it gradually because when I came in, I saw that you were all soaked. The power of God have moved, you have enjoyed the presence of God, you've danced and everything. So I want to instruct you in <laughs> glory to Jesus. So maybe the quarter I will bring in this morning is just to teach you and then we'll have time to pray. Why? Glory to God. Will that be a blessing to somebody? Our topic for the conference is Maranatha. And amazingly, that word was used once in scriptures. The word Maranatha. And it was used with another compound word in scriptures. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 22. Paul said if there is any one of you that does not love the Lord. If there be anyone among you that does not love the Lord. He say, let that one be anathema, maranatha. You see because of the weight of what Paul wanted to communicate. That word could not be captured. <laughs> you see, the translators had a challenge trying to give definition to those words. Because the word anathema, it means to hang off something that is consecrated. Just like the life of a man is already sold out to God, but that man is removed and kept on a shelf, and you do nothing about that man until the Lord comes. So, the essence of this word in itself is not God come, God come, as it has always been interpreted. This word was used to let us know the significance of having relationship with God. So, Paul was emphasizing that if a believer, a consecrated person, does not have experiential relationship with God, what happens to that man is that even though he's consecrated, he said that man will be kept on a shelf until God comes. If there be any man that love not Jesus Christ, he said let him be anathema maranatha. That means you can be in the sanctuary of God, but you are kept on a shelf. What it means is that your life no longer strikes a chord in eternity. You are part of the company of believers. You are praying in tongues. You are fasting. You are worshipping with the believers. 
But because the love of God is not in the chamber of your soul, he said your services have no value. So you may be the one leading the prayer for the whole year. But if by any means the immortals come into the auditorium and they begin to sound the heart of men in order to bring them into depths of stature and ranking with God. He said, even though you are the one on the altar, your position is what? Anatema Maranatha. So your prayer has no value. Your fasting has no value. Your oratory, your capacity in the church has no value. The reason is because love is not in your heart for Jesus. The significance of this word is not a cry for Lord come. The significance for this word is for people to begin to grow in the love of God. This is why Jesus diagnosing the condition of the church in Ephesus. The church in Ephesus was a church that was discerning in the spirit. They had understanding. The Bible said they proved the apostles. That means they had depth in spiritual intelligence to the degree that they could judge spiritual things. And even men that had authority in the kingdom of God, they could discern the stature of their calling and determine whether they were accurate with God. They had such level of spiritual intelligence. The Bible said they proved the apostles. It was in the church in Ephesus that Paul taught the highest mystery that he ever learned. But when Jesus was diagnosing the condition of the church in Ephesus from the regions of Zion, Jesus said, you have lost your first love. And because there was no love in that church for God, he said their candlestick will be removed. You know that when the candlestick is removed in heaven, on earth you can be the biggest church. But territorially you have no implication. In heaven you have no relevance. Because you are singing praise and worship on earth but you are not an illumination in the spirit realm. The reason is because there is no love. So you are anatema maranata. So everything you are doing is pending until the Lord comes. It's a delicate position for a believer to be. So when we begin to read scriptures like this, these are the times where we, we apply Selah. We shut down, first of all, to judge our intention. When you are leading the prayer in church and you are screaming and you are causing vibration, what is your motivation? These kinds of prayer, these kinds of scriptures rather, are scriptures that probe into our heart to judge our essence. What are the things that facilitate? Hope you know even putting programs like this together costs a lot of money. But what is your motivation? Because when the spirit comes to probe you, he is not so moved by the things you do. It doesn't take a spirit anything to generate any ripple effect. They are the ones that rule the affairs of men. But when a spirit comes to a territory where people are functionaries, what he does is first of all to check. So when I look at scriptures like this, it brings heaviness to my heart. And then I settle down. This travel that I travel from place to place every other week, what is my motivation? That is why Paul says you can give your body to be burnt. But if you have not love. You see a man who comes, he's burnt to the stake. You say, what kind of man is this? A spirit may judge him and say, the sacrifice that that man has put on the table does not have weight enough compared to a man that gave 1,000 naira. So you can come to a point where your body is not as important as 1,000. Because the man who is giving 1,000 is giving by law. He's motivated by law. But you who went as far as giving your body to be born, when they checked your heart, there was no love there. So Paul said that your sacrifice is useless. So spirit doesn't, don't judge us based on the weight of what we do. They judge us first of all from the depths of our operation. And one of the things that define our depth is the quality of our love for Jesus. The significance of Maranatha is not Lord come. The significance of Maranatha is who are you before God? What is the quality of your heart? What is the condition of your heart? Every time you walk with the Spirit of God, it is possible for you to come to a place where you are doing everything you are doing because you are the leader. You may not even discern your condition that you are already falling. Until maybe something goes wrong and they remove you from that position. Then you will now discover that that church will come every day as the first man. Suddenly the Z dies. You now stroll to church casually and you sit at the back. You are no longer the leader. Your motivation was not love for Jesus. You may discover that you give and you keep giving more than every other person. Until one day the pastor offends you. Or they didn't recognize you as they should recognize you. All of a sudden your money goes back to your pocket. 
you no longer advance the kingdom. At first, you say you love the kingdom of God, so you can give anything to advance the kingdom of God until they remove the honor that is on your life in the house of God. And then suddenly you now discover that what was motivating you was not the kingdom advance. What was motivating you was the honor that is upon your life. Your condition is what? Anatema Maranatha. You can be the lead vocalist in the choir. And because every time there's a massive crusade, you are the one that leads. And suddenly they have a program like this. And all of a sudden they say, you will not be the lead solo. This time around, let somebody else do it. And all of a sudden, your zeal for the program. The program you prepared for eight months. Now the program has come. Your zeal have died. Because you will no longer be on the altar. They say your condition is anatema maranata. These are scriptures that call us to meditate on our lives. Because the challenge of walking with the spirit is that he will be patient until the end. If only spirits come to us to tell us, this is your condition, no, this is your condition, it would have been good. Did you read about Judas? Jesus saw him doing everything he was doing. And even at the 11th hour, Jesus said, that which you must do, do quickly. This guy was heading into his destruction. And Jesus looked at him and said, what? That which you must do, do quickly. What if Judas was notified that the direction you are going, the end is that you'll be the son of perdition. It would have helped his destiny. But when a spirit wants to judge you, he waits until the end. And at the end, there is no room to change the game anymore. The story has already been concluded. So he said, if you don't have love. The second thing that scripture reveals to us is that the ticker of the quality of our work in the spirit is not our gifts. The checker of the quality of our work with God is not our charisma. The checker of the quality of our, of our work with God is not in our capacity. It's in our love for Jesus. If we don't love the Lord, our capacity is vain. Listen, you can come here and genuinely, you are the only man that has the capacity to cause everybody to pray through the night. And that's a very beautiful position to be. It's an ex exceptional manifestation of the grace of God. But you, your capacity will be useless if there's no love. The first thing I talked about was motivation. Love is the checker of our motivation. The second thing now is that love is the checker of the quality of our relationship with God. Your capacity is useless unless, first of all, this thing is at the center. Paul finished writing to the Corinthians. Remember, the church in Corinth is the most gifted of all the churches. When Paul wrote to churches, he wrote to churches based on their conditions. Paul was a wise master builder. He didn't write to people because he knew the word of God. You know, it's one of the temptations of people who are not yet mature. Everywhere you go, you want to display what you have. Maybe you are coming to a place people have heard about you. So as you showed up there, it's an opportunity for you to display everything that you have. Because to you, it's a statement you are making to where you are going to. But Paul was not like that. When Paul entered the territory, he diagnosed the need those people had in the spirit and he emphasized it. Paul could come to a church and he will not move in any gift of the spirit. He was in Ephesus and for two and a half years he was only arguing and debating. Because he knew that the problem of the people was that they were given to ideologies and philosophies. So their crisis was not sickness. Their crisis was the fact that philosophies of the Greek theologians had put them in slavery. In slave. So throughout his stay in Ephesus, he was arguing. Paul would go to the marketplace and argue from morning to night. And then you would look at him and say, Ah, I thought Paul was an anointed preacher. Anointing at that point was not what the people needed. What the people needed was clarity. They needed understanding. So when Paul showed up in the territory, it was the need of the people that determined the dispense of grace in his life. Jesus said to them in John 16, 13, He said, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot receive it. That means Jesus did not talk to people because he knew. Jesus spoke to people because of their needs. I have many things to tell you, but you can't receive it. How be it when the spirit of truth is come? He will guide you into all truths. Verse 12, I have many things to tell you. You can't receive it. How be it when the spirit of truth is come? So Jesus himself, even though he was the completeness of the word of God, 
He did not just talk because he knew all things. Jesus tells you what you need by time. As you are now, there are things you need for tomorrow. Jesus will keep it until tomorrow comes. Jesus will tell you what you need for today in order to execute his counsel for your life today. Even though he knows what you will need in the next 20 years, he may not tell you. And he may even speak and he will hide it from you. You will hear it but you can have understanding. So, when a man gains maturity, he addresses people at the point of their need. Paul will come to Galatia. And all Paul was doing in Galatia was to use his apostolic authority to establish them back to grace. Because the legalists wanted to draw them back to the law. Paul would come to Corinth. The people were carried away by gifts. And they were living in sin. Yet, they were judging their maturity by their gifts. So somebody comes to church and he flows in word of knowledge for four hours. And they say, this man has stature. This man has stature. So Paul came and said, you are babes. You are carnal. And then he began to show them the importance and the administration of the gifts of the spirit. So the reason he taught them was because they needed to have understanding as to what really mattered, not what they could do. He came to Ephesus and the argument was to correct their theology. The reason is simple. Because what they needed by time is what God was doing in their lives. And I, I, I'm using that to explain to you that if you don't have love for God, your capacity is vain. So a man comes for a meeting, you think you came to see certain things, but there is an issue in your life. That's what God wants to address. This morning, what is the quality of the love of God in your heart? You can lead prayer on the altar for 10 hours. How long do you pray in your bedroom? You can give on the altar for the poor because they made a call to give to the poor and you walk to the altar to drop something. But when you see the poor on the street, how often do you give to them? You can lead worship here for three hours and you are leading the worship, you are crying. When was the last time you worshiped God in your room and cried? Capacity is useless without the love of God. Maranatha is not just Jesus come. Maranatha is a definition of the quality of our relationship with God. Thirdly, Maranatha speaks of maturity. Spiritual maturity. One of the crises of the church, of the body of Christ today, is that there are too many babes on the platform. One of the crises in the house of God today is that there are too many babes doing too many things in the house of God. So the more we do what we do, the more room we open to territorial spirits to have influence in the house of God. Most times, demons are shielded from the house of God. We begin to walk. If we were not carrying out activity on the altar, demonic influences would have been reduced. But every time we come here, we open up chambers for operation of the demonic realm. Because our life is full of too many garbages. The man who is leading the worship, he comes up and to him is a show. He doesn't understand that what he's doing is a hollow thing. And he should do it with fear and trembling. The man who is ministering, when he comes up, to him is a show either of how much scripture he knows or of his skill of handling scripture or of how anointed he is. What he doesn't realize is that his life is supposed to be a gate through which God flows into the auditorium. The man who is on the pulpit, his goal is to prove a point that he is the current most anointed person and that there are many things he can do. Meanwhile, while he was on the altar, God was emphasizing something different but he's under pressure. Even the man who invited the preacher is under pressure for the show. He's not bothered about what God wants to tell the people. And it's all about carnal manifestations. The reason is simply because we don't have maturity. This is why many revivals are truncated. People begin to call upon the name of the Lord genuinely. The devil say, wait, let them do what they are doing. At the end of the day, that spiritual investment will be a waste. Because he knows that they've not given themselves to the protocol of the spirit to face the maturity. So it is when God is actually pleased that confusion comes in. So you see five people that love themselves, pressing after God, pushing after God. The devil is not troubled. He knows the zeal they have, he can't stop them. So instead of wasting his resources stopping them, he allows them to continue with their prayer. 
And then these people pray until God now anoints one and his eyes open and he becomes a prophet. And every time they are praying, that one begins to prophesy. The next thing, the four others go back and they begin to gossip the one that is prophesying. The devil have not come in, but their immaturity have destroyed what God is doing. The devil doesn't need to come among believers that are not mature. Their immaturity will destroy what God is doing. And if God helps the four others and they are supporting the one who is prophesying, all of a sudden the one who is prophesying becomes a king. He now wants to go out, he tells them to clean his shoes. Because all of a sudden, all the honorarium now comes to him. Because people are looking for the one that can perform. All of a sudden, all the honor comes to him. Meanwhile, five of them began. The ministry suddenly becomes for the one who is gifted. And then the ones who are not gifted, he tactically pushes them out. In fact, he will be the one to purge them from the system. They started as five men that God gave a vision. But only him became anointed. What he will do is that he will make sure these four never exist in that vision. He will put that, that vision and raise a new generation because he doesn't want people at his level. Meanwhile, the mandate that God gave was for five. And not knowing that he's, he's ostracizing the other four have already destroyed the potential of what God wants to do. Immaturity in the house of God. We think it's about things. We think it's about show. So every time we come before God, our focus is not Jesus. Our focus is things. You see people fasting and praying for a whole year. You ask them what is their motivation. They want to flow in word of knowledge. To what end? They don't even have body for souls. So word of knowledge is to come on the altar and to manifest. And then people say, oh boy, that guy is forensic. His goal is satisfied. For everybody to talk about them that they are forensic. Somebody is praying for power for one year. You ask him what is the problem. He doesn't even have body for the sick. You will think he's calling for power because he is tired with the oppression of the devil. You will think he wants to do something because he cannot tolerate what the devil is doing to people anymore. When you change his life, it is only power that we announce him. So what is pursuing his announcement? It has nothing to do with God and his kingdom. Immaturity. So we mature in the minors. Our focus are not on things that have eternal value. But when spirits come to weigh your work, they will not be moved by your abilities. They will be moved by the exactness, the accuracy of your heart with God. I told them the other time, Noah for 100 years was flowing in unstopped discernment of spirits. Every dimension of the ark that Noah built, Noah was seeing it in the spirit and building it in the natural. When God came, the Bible never recorded about his discerning ability. All the Bible looked at was his heart. He said he feared God. When God spoke, he said he moved with fear. So that was the only thing that pleased God. Among men, you may say, oh boy, this guy is anointed. Oh. So he will go to heaven. He will look and say, kai, kai, kai. that place you put that nail. When I saw in heaven, there is no nail there. Remove that nail and put the nail this side. You say, Jesus. Is it heaven? Somebody is looking at like this. That thing will wow men, not spirits. When God showed up, what moved God was the heart of Noah. He said Noah was moving constantly in fear. The fear of God was what gave Noah credence in heaven. Maturity. Maturity to be able to handle spiritual things with honor and dignity is lacking. We are here now, you think we love God. Wait until God drops something on us. Wait until all of us here begin to touch substance. Maybe suddenly gives a job and begins to earn money in six digits. That's when you will see him you and say, come to the house and tell me about the program. The person that was running around and you say, ah, this person is humble. Wait until he has money in his account. Wait until everybody talks about it. The guy that easily apologizes whenever he's wrong. And you say, oh, God has set his heart. Wait until he has power. So we expand ourselves pursuing after the things God has to offer, not God. And when those things come, those things become the reason why we are destroyed. Why do you pursue after word of knowledge? Why do you pursue after the healing anointing? Why do you pursue after open doors? Why do you pursue after platforms? Why do you pursue after a good voice? Why do you pursue after deliverance power? Is it for Jesus and his kingdom? Or is it because you think that's what will make you? It is impurity. But when we discern correctly what is the body in the heart of the Father, our priorities will change. 
our priorities are wrong because we are babes. That's why the Bible said in Ephesians 5.27, it said that God is coming for a church without spot or wrinkles. So what we invoke the coming of Jesus, our ability to come to a point of perfection. When we have gained maturity and we know how to handle hallowed matters, then at that point, we are able to call on Maranatha. So Maranatha is not necessarily a prayer. They call Maranatha a contemplative prayer. But it is beyond it. Maranatha is not necessarily a prayer. Maranatha is actually a state of the heart. When the church comes to maturity, naturally, the Lord will come. This is the reason why God gave the fivefold. He said to some, he gave to be apostles. Ephesians 4, 11. To some, he gave to be prophets. To some, he gave to be evangelists. Stores and teacher for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Until we all come to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. Maturity. But maturity is lacking in the body of Christ. Many investment of God in lives have been wasted because the church is not growing. Many investment. Most times, the reason Christians, the believers, and the body of Christ is pushed to a corner as if it has no power. It's not because there's no investment of divinity. It's because we are immature. God releases everything we need to have territorial influence. But we are immature. One person has power and he runs away. And he thinks it's about self. One person is enabled. He runs away. One person is blessed. He runs A corporate gathering that God is raising in order to have ranking to be able to challenge darkness. All of a sudden, that gathering scatters because God begins to bless them. Maranatha is a call for maturity. What is the quality of Christ that is formed in your heart? Paul said for him, one of the reasons he's motivated to pray is so that Christ can be formed in the heart of his children. He said, my little children, of whom I travail again in prayer, that Christ be formed in you. Paul knew that was the first and the heaviest molecule of divinity in the life of a man. If Christ is not formed, then every other thing God gives is a waste. What is the quality of your maturity? What, to what extent have you grown about the things of God? The things that motivate you, why do you desire them? Maranatha. Fourthly, Maranatha is an awakening call for the gospel to be preached to the ends of the earth. The Bible said in Matthew 24, 14, it said this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness to all the nations of the world. He said, then the end will come. Every time we pray and ask God to come, they waste. There are things that scriptures have outlined as precursors for the coming of God. This is one of them. Because when you say Maranatha, you say, Lord, come. But it is not to call him to come. They are precursors. God himself has instituted these precursors to bring about the release of the spirit. What are those precursors? This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness. What is the quality of your witness? The class where you are, the hostel where you are, the school where you are, what is the quality of your witness? Scriptures like this are cause of awakening. It is a beautiful thing to join the choir. It's a beautiful thing to join the prayer band. And we come to church and excite ourselves so much. But our immediate friends don't feel the vibration. Our immediate family don't feel the vibration. Our roommates don't feel the vibration. That means what we are doing here is fake. If I call myself a preacher and it has not affected my friends and my family, what I am doing is caricature. I am only reciting what I heard. A parrot can do a better job. But if there is witness in my life, it should affect everybody around me. That's why everybody that came around Jesus became a preacher. That was the, the kind of life he was living. So there was no way you came around Jesus and it doesn't affect you. You could come as a fisherman. You could come as a tax collector. You could come as a sinner. But if you meet him, something will happen to you. You will become who he is. 
what is the quality of our witness? That's one of the calls that scriptures like 1 Corinthians 16 22 gives us. They call for witness. How much of God can you demonstrate to your world? Is it about tonguing in church? Now we have, we have so reduced the, the value of prayer. As hard good as prayer is, all prayer is now is time. It's now time. We pray for seven hours. We pray for ten hours. We pray for twelve hours. The question is not how long you are praying. The things you are praying about, how much of it is happening. I told them in Lagos last week, I said if you want to judge the quality of your territorial intercession, don't judge it by how long you pray. Judge it by the texture of the life of God that is seen in that territory. The elders of old, they knew what to look at. These guys, sometimes they tarried in prayer for 10 days. Nobody goes home. You will never hear it in scripture that they pray for 10 hours. Because even though how long we pray is important, the goal is not the time. The goal is the effect of the prayer. People pray, but their tongue is a lying tongue. People fasting, but their tongue is a lying tongue. And they never pay attention to it. They come to church and pray. And the moment they go out of the church building, they are a different people. So even the devil we allow, go and pray. When you finish, come back. Let's do business together. Meanwhile, the goal of the prayer is for you to come into intimacy with God so that you can carry God to your world. But you have missed the priority. The goal is no longer witnessing. The goal is now a show of what we can do. So we waste spiritual things. Jesus said, don't give spiritual things to the swine. He will take it from you and stamp, he will stamp it underfoot. People praying for graces to make a show out of is a heart cry. The Bible spoke about the disciples. Just a handful of them. The Bible said, these be the men that turn their walls upside down. In our day today, our priority is the number of people we can sit in our auditorium. It's no longer about the effect of our message in our territory. Meanwhile, the Bible said concerning the apostles, they said they have littered the whole of Jerusalem with their doctrine. That means the guy who is selling in the market is talking the language of the apostles. The guy who is, who is walking in the bank is talking the language of the apostles. They say they turn their words upside down. Is there anything wrong with a large congregation? No. But what is the effect in the territory? Maranatha. A call for witnessing. You have been a Christian for five years. Up till now, nobody comes to you because they can't see God in you. So there can be no experience of the, of the return of Jesus in your life. You may deceive yourself and tell yourself a whole lot of things, but Jesus cannot be seen in your life. You have been a believer for 10 years. Nobody can come to you and say, Sister, give me godly counsel. I'm not talking about somebody who is sick and say, come and pray for me. Nobody has seen God in your life enough to have a challenge and say, please, what do I do? Nobody has seen enough in your life to come to you and say, please help me. I have a challenge. I don't know what the devil is doing in my life. There is no witness. There is no sufficient witness. But the Bible said in 2 Peter 2, 9, it said, but you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. He said, God's own special people. A peculiar nation. He said, called forth to show. So it's not just about being now. It is to be enough that you can demonstrate. He said, to show forth the virtues, the perfections and the excellences of him that have called you to glory and virtue. But the witness of our life is not sufficient. Because we have not come to a point where our life is a complete committer to God. Maranatha. This is why you may cry, Lord, come, Lord, come, Lord, come. Your voice will not ascend beyond your ceiling. You may do it and cry. And when you are done crying for three hours, you will feel comfortable. That's biochemical reaction. Your loudest statement about the call of Jesus to come is the quality of your witness. It's because of few men that we are gathered like this. What if we had 20 of you? So we run to programs now to see somebody stand on the altar and demonstrate. And the man of God prepares himself to come and perform. But when the apostles came out, the quality of their preaching was not their dexterity of scripture. The quality of their preaching 
was not their excellent communication. Their quality, the quality of their preaching was the transformation in the lives of people. He said the reason they were apostles is for the perfecting of the saints. So the man is preaching well if people are transformed. If people are not transformed, no matter how intelligent he sounds, he's not preaching well. Paul said, I, beloved, 1 Corinthians 2, from verse 1 to 4, he said, when I came unto you, came not I with excellency of speech, declaring unto you the counsel of God. He said, I choose not to know anything among you but Christ and him crucified. He said, when I came, my preaching and my word was in the demonstration of spirit and power. Why? He said that your faith. So everything Paul was doing had nothing to do with himself. He said, because of your faith. The reason I preached the way I preached, the reason I acted the way I acted was your faith. He said, that your faith will not be built in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's a man that knows priority. That's a witness. Let me tell you a short story. It doesn't take God anything to make you. It doesn't cost a spirit anything. Whether be it the Holy Spirit or a demonic spirit. Most times what spirit look at before they begin to raise a man is the quality of the witness that that man can produce. It takes a spirit nothing to make you. Overnight, your name can be noised around the nations. It takes God nothing. It also takes a demon nothing. Early this year, I heard of two dirty young boys who were somewhere around Ajegula in Lagos. They just did a video rapping and they put it on Instagram. And in two weeks, in two weeks, they had 99,000 views. Why? Because one of the superstars carried the video and shared it and wrote a comment about the potential the boys had. In that same two weeks, these guys were picked from where they were. They did a collab with one of the top music guys and in two weeks, they became superstars. These guys were about 16 years, 17 years old. So what they could not achieve by their family lineage, by their family heritage and by their age, all their lives, they had it in two weeks. By law of natural selection, they were not given advantage to prosper because they were born into poor homes, into poor territories. By reason of age, they have not even come up to provide for themselves. But the spirit united on them. And in two weeks, their story changed. It doesn't take a spirit anything to make you. The question is, what is the quality of your witness? If God empowers you today, what will the effect be in the spirit realm? Those are the things that bothers a spirit. Because when he places his influence on your life, in one week your story can change. But what will be the quality of your influence? What will be the quality of your witness? Are you the type that all of a sudden when you get... You know the Bible said something. In, a, in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul said, never raise a novice. He said, when he is risen, the devil will take advantage of him and he will bring reproach to the body. What God judges in our lives truly is the quality of our witness. But many are not aware. This is why every time your priorities must be right. The first thing that determines your accuracy is not how much scripture you know. It's the love you have for Jesus in your heart. You can't deny it. If it is there, it is there. If it is not there, it's not there. Every time you move, I love the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Ghost is like an alarm in your heart. He will never keep quiet. He will keep blowing that alarm. Every time you take an action, the Holy Ghost will tell you your motivation. As you came up to worship God, if your consciousness is on your dress, the Holy Ghost will tell you. He will never keep quiet. That is one of the things He came to do in your life. Because He came to perfect you. If your consciousness is your skill, the Holy Ghost will tell you. He will not keep quiet. Because the goal is to bring you to a point where the love of God becomes chief cornerstone in your heart. And if that is not achieved, everything you are doing in time may be a waste. Everything you look out for may be a waste. Everybody Jesus healed died again. So you should know that Jesus is interested, is more interested in you than your healing. Even though he paid the price for your healing, he's more interested in your soul. Everybody, even the ones Jesus raised from the dead, they died again. 
but what will make you eternally relevant? He invested all his life in his 12 disciples and those that followed him. Those ones live with him forever. He said they will sit with him on 12 thrones to join the 12 tribes of Israel. So he met the say, who is sick. He spent one second with that person. He goes away. But the disciple that is not healing, he spent three years with him. At the end of the day, that disciple becomes eternally relevant. But the guy that was healed is lost. You don't hear about him anymore. Why do you think spirits behave the way they do? Eternal relevance. This morning, the first question is that, do you really love the Lord as you make it look? When you come to church and you do all you do, is Jesus truly your motivation? When you hear the word of God, is it Jesus you are looking for? Nowadays, I even become so careful. You are preaching the gospel, people are clapping because of the way you are talking. And then you hear people trying to score what you said. So I became scared. I went back to the Lord. I'm like, what is this? I was in Ibadan where ministering to the teenager. And I told them, please say after me, I don't want patterns. I don't want dimensions. I don't want potters. I don't want, I want to hear God. So, <laughs> nowadays if you come to a place where they are heard your, they've heard your message before, you are even careful. Because you may start preaching and people are clapping, you think they are scared. It's what you are saying that is impressing them. They will need the meeting, no transformation. So nowadays, I come to ask people questions. Because if you go home, you will remember the question. What motivates your action in the house of God and outside of the house of God? Do you know why people are different in church? Do you know why people sustain a disposition in church that is different from their disposition out there? They want to create impression here. Their true state is when you meet them in the market. When you meet them on the campus. That's who they are. But when they come to church, all of us want to create impression that we know God. But if the love of God is established in your heart, even when nobody sees you, you will leave because you have a relationship. You will leave because you know him. You will leave because he is one with you. That's the goal of the father. What is it that motivates your actions in the church? It is a beautiful thing that we've come and we stayed awake all night. You may think God is so impressed because we are awake. When God comes here to carry out a census, what he will be checking is our heart. He said, Samuel looked at Obia and he was excellent in all his look. And he said, no, it is the destiny of man to look at the outward. That's why we come and we want to impress ourselves because we know it is the destiny of man to look at the outward. He said, but I look at the heart. If you know that the one before whom you have to do is not seeing your look and the excellence of your demonstration, but is looking at your heart, your message will change. Your gesticulation will change. Your disposition will change. Because before that one looks at your outward, he will look at your heart. A man showed up in the natural, he was without blemish. But his heart was not fit. Another man, the Bible said he was rooted. He was in the backside of the desert. But his heart was accurate. And God said, go and anoint him. What is it that motivates you? You may have the best voice in the choir. But it's not your voice they hear in heaven. The one that his voice pierces through the veil into Zion. Is the one that sings with a pure heart. That's the one that his voice is echoed in eternity. You may be singing on earth with the best voice and you think because people are emotional beings, they are crying, they are falling. You think, oh, you are doing something. But you will be shocked that when a spirit pays attention, the echo is hearing your own is not part of it. Because he's hearing you not through your tongue, he's hearing you through your heart. Your vocabularies in the spirit come through your heart, not through your mouth. But many are not aware. That's why we come to church, we do the things we do. That's why we come to church. It's all about impressing people. It's all about everything we do is trapped in the natural. And the prince is in darkness, they are aware. So the devil will give you many reasons why you should build your life around yourself. So that self becomes the circumference of your reality. But men who understand how the spirit of God works, they leave flesh, they leave self, and they journey into the womb of the spirit. They ask God, Lord, what will you have me do? You can come for a meeting and God says sing and you will sing and go home. Because you are first of all connected to him before you are connected to the people. You can come for a meeting. You have a message. While you are the altar, on the altar, Jesus tells you to change the message. 
and to say what he wants to say. Meanwhile, this message is a message that every time you preach it, everywhere is scattered. But today, Jesus said, change it. You can come for a meeting. You want to sit in front and cross your leg because you dress well. Jesus tells you, sit at the back. That is not doctrine. It is intimacy. It is love. It is relationship. You can come to a place. You carry the microphone to lead the song. You were the one that practiced. But Jesus tells you, your heart is not right. And then you be humbly hand that microphone to somebody else. Because you are more interested in preserving your relationship with him than to create a show before men. And that day, even though you have the best voice, you will give the mic away. You will be shocked that your worship in giving that mic away will be louder than the whole chorus of the choir. Because a spirit has seen that you are interested in him, not in things. These are the things men don't know. When I realized that it is God that makes men, I decided to travel in the direction of God. You will do a lot of things. You will think your charisma will open doors for you. You will think your anointing will open doors for you. You don't know the spirit that manipulates this realm. You will be the most anointed. But it is the guy that you despise that God will alight upon. That's why men fight men. That's why men have envy and jealousy. You are in the fellowship. You thought you are the one who is more, more special. And then God comes and anoints the least expected. And then you can't believe it. Why, why will God anoint Daniel? What does he have that I don't have? You don't know spirits. You only know men. If you know spirits, you will change your disposition. What does Sandra have that is always about her? No, it's not what she has, it's her heart. Because every time that spirit comes with influence, it drops it on the heart of those who are perfect before him. You will carry your charisma and you will remain in one cubicle until one day you wake up with gray hair and then you will become an elder there. But the guy that you think has no future in God, that's the one that God will announce to the whole nations. And that man can only sing a song, God will sit on that song. He will preach a short message. God will sit on the message. People will hear it and they will say, Who is this? It is a spirit at work. But it begins with a heart that is perfect before the Lord. You may look at yourself and say, I'm not qualified. God can't use me. You now sit down. You see Sister Mary. Every time she carries the microphone, everywhere is shaking. You now say, But I can never be like Sister Mary. It is not men that God used to judge. The Bible said they that compare themselves with themselves are not wise. Why God will use you is because of your heart. There were many orators in Israel. It was Moses the stammer that God came from. Many orators. Many grew up as Israelites. They knew the ways of Israel. Moses who grew in the palace of Pharaoh was the one God came from. First of all, the Bible said he was schooled and skilled in all of the ways of Egypt. So Moses was an Egyptian by training. But that was the one God came from. How about the guy who was of the Levi family? Who was king in scripture? Why would God leave all of them and come for Moses? God needed a man to speak for him. Why would you come for an orator? Because God sees the heart. All of them were in Egypt. Nobody had body for Israel. Only Moses had body. All of them were crying for deliverance. Nobody had body. Only Moses. So God checked his heart and came for him. What is the quality of your heart to us come? I'm telling you this because most of you are young. Listen, you can attend many meetings. They are very important, but they will not make you. You will meet many anointed men of God. They will lay hands on you. They are very important because those things they drop on you, they are seeds in your spirit. When God begins to raise you, those seeds will come alive. But those things alone cannot make you. Your journey into prosperity in the things of God begins when your heart becomes right with you. A man whose heart is corrupt, even God can't help you. That's why God could not help Judas. The heart was already destroyed and compromised. Even Jesus could not help him. The same error that Judas committed was the same error that Peter committed. All of them betrayed Jesus. But one had the right heart. Another one had the wrong heart. If your heart is wrong, you are lost. Every time we want to walk with God, we want to journey in the way of the Spirit, before we pursue after things, we first of all walk on our heart. You will call upon the Lord every day and tell the Lord, I am callous. I am pursuing you because I want your anointing. I am pursuing you because I want fame. I am pursuing you because I want influence. I don't love you. Help my heart. The moment God begins to help the heart of a man, that man is preparing himself for greatness. The men that God sends us for greatness are the men that their heart are right towards him. Paul said, 
he said if a man does not love the Lord Jesus Christ he is an Atema Maranatha his condition is that he should be kept waiting for God because even we cannot discern his end what is the quality of your heart there are many things that you can do in this kingdom there are many potentials you have especially for some of us who are gifted our case is worse because it will be difficult for us to slow down a man who can talk he doesn't need God to help him when he comes to preach he knows what to say he understands human psychology as I am now I know what I will begin to say in the next 5 minutes and this hall will turn around now I know what to say in the next 5 minutes many of you here will begin to cry I know what to say in the next 5 minutes and this place will begin to boil the power of God will come here that's the greatest that's the greatest undoing of a man who is charismatic a man who is gifted is that he can easily rely on his gift and not God it is difficult for that man to ask God what will you have me do the only day that man is yielded to God is the day his disadvantage the day he tries to shake himself as at other time and it doesn't work that's when he will cry did you read about Samson did you ever read that Samson called on the name of the Lord he never did until his hair was cut off it is the day his gift is lost that he remembers God every man who is gifted finds it difficult to lean and to rely on God unless God helps his heart every time something has a challenge the Bible says he shook himself and then the hair starts and he begins to do what he wants to do he never consulted with God until the day his eyes were plumbed up that's when something realized that his help comes from the Lord never be at that position you must always put your heart and allow God to censor your heart when you come to pray for 10 hours instead of you to pray and go to tell people that I pray for 10 hours use that period as a period of a heart check tell the Lord to check your heart tell the Lord to try your range the Bible said the Lord tests the heart he tries the ring to give to every man as his way should be tell the Lord to censor your heart some of us are callous we are not aware your heart what is the quality of your heart was God many of us have lost our love for God the reason we come for meeting and we wait is because we are trusting God that by all means the man of God will pray for the sick and we heard that every time he prays the sick are healed and the moment we are healed we go back to our world we will not be relevant like that for too long many of us the reason we pray and fast is because we are looking for an anointing an anointing will not make you relevant with God it is your heart that will make you relevant what is the quality of your heart towards God what is the condition of your heart towards God have you checked it in recent times have you checked the things you think about have you checked your motivation some of the things you do if you sat down to check your heart you will, be, you will wonder is it me that did this I have done many wicked things and when God opened my eyes to see I broke down you will think you are special you will think you are good until God opens your eyes Isaiah was a prophet on earth everybody hailed him he was a national prophet until the day heaven opened and when he appeared before God he said woe unto me this is a man that prophesied to nations but the moment he appeared before God the first prophecy he gave to himself was damnation he said woe unto me and the man of unclean lips he never knew the condition of his heart his gift had beclouded the senses he thought it was all about prophecy prophecy but when God appeared before him he saw for the first time that his heart was evil and his mouth was corrupt on earth he was a prophet but in heaven he was a liar in heaven he was a man condemned what is the quality of your heart don't wait until you go to eternity before you now realize that everything you do your heart condemned it every time you gave out money and you sacrificed so much your heart condemned your giving even when you were killed for Jesus and you thought you will receive the crown of life your heart condemned it none of your sacrifice count because your heart was wrong all those times when you came to church you trekked under the rain you came and worshipped God all the rehearsals all the vigils you now go to heaven and discover it was a waste because your heart destroyed everything you did for God don't wait to heaven don't wait until you get to heaven to discover while you are on earth the Bible says you should check your heart ask the Lord to try your heart ask the Lord to test your heart and to reveal to you because you want to love him for who he is Jesus went to heaven and when he came back he gathered his disciples and he called Peter he said lovest thou me more than this I thought it was about leadership skill I thought it was about charisma 
I thought it was about ordination. It was came to be that he zeroed it. He said, lovest thou me more than this? What will make you lead the body is not because you are there by ordination. What will make you lead the body is not because you are the wisest. What will make you lead the body is not because you are the most special. It's because the law, my law is engraved in your heart. He said, lovest thou me? He asked him three times. The Bible said, Peter was grieved. And Peter said to him, Lord, you know. And it was on the basis of Peter's law that he said, keep my sheep. Keep my sheep. Keep my sheep. A man who has no love for God has no assignment for God. Everything you are doing is a waste. You are self-deceived. Tonight, the first question is, what is the love of God in your heart? I didn't come here to display to you the things I can do. I came here to invite you into something that God wants you to be a part of. You may look as if you are not relevant. You may be a stammerer. You may be a man who is so young in age. You may be a man who has nobody to help you. You have no exposure. All of that thing is nothing. The spirit that relates with you is your advantage. But what will beat you is the quality of your heart. If your heart can be set aright, your age will not count. Your deformities will not count. Your inabilities will not count. If only your heart is right before God. We are a generation that have a wrong heart, a wrong motive, a wrong intention. The question tonight is, do you really love Jesus? It is simple and basic, but that is what will determine how far we go in this kingdom. Do you love Jesus? I know you say a lot of things about God. I know they call you a prophet. I know they call you a psalmist. I know they call you a minstrel. But the question tonight is, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? I know you can give all your money. You have emptied your bank account before. But do you love Jesus? I know you have traveled to the forest before to do evangelism. But the question is that, do you love Jesus? If you don't love Jesus, everything is a waste. It's as simple as that. It's as plain as that. We begin from the position of love.
your whole work will be lost. No matter how influential you are among men, you will not be relevant among spirits. I don't desire to be famous. I don't desire to be popular among men. I desire to be popular in the realm of God. When I come to heaven, let the immortal stand and say, a, just a noble song, I've come back home. Those were the things that, that is informed the pursuit of men like Paul. He said, I have run my race. I have finished my cup. They awaited me a crown of glory. As far as Paul was concerned, whether you clap for him, it doesn't mean anything. Whether you insult him, it doesn't mean anything. Whether you give him money, it doesn't mean anything. His focus was inside. For such a man, men don't impress them. I'm not moved because you clapped. I'm not moved because you sang a song in my name. I'm not moved because you insulted me. I've come to realize that men are only relevant in Zion. On earth, everything is a lie. Time itself will vanish. Your looks will vanish. Everything that you invested for in time will vanish away. If you are 30 years old, you have been educated enough. When you were young, you look handsome. You look beautiful. Now that you are growing older, you are becoming another creator. Because nothing in time has an eternal foundation. It is only in Zion that the foundation of the life of man is built. But for you to be relevant in Zion, the heart, the heart factor. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? We are going to pray again. But this time around, the focus of our prayer is not to vibrate this beauty. Is to vibrate our heart so that the chaff and the garbage will fall off. So that the debris that the devil has planted will fall off. For you to be relevant, something must happen to your heart. Something God must have to do a surgery in your heart. You want to pray now? Rise up to your feet. Help your heart. 
Ask the Lord to help your heart. You'll be amazed that that might be the most important prayer you will pray this year. That God should help your heart. It will travel with you into eternity. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.